This podcast contains strong language and adult themes. Listener's discretion is advised. Hello and welcome to A Page Too Far, the show where each week one of us reads a book and tells the other all about it, see? Will it be bad? Will it be good? Well, honey, let's find out. Hello, I am a Best Bin technician, and this is my co-host for the evening, Luke Skywalker's Severed Hand. You guys can't see this, but he's like signing, uh, how's it going to me? With his fingers. <laughs> no, he literally just flipped me off. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, for real, how's it going? It's it's going pretty good. Actually, I was going to do I was going to do this, which is... What is that? It's just loop and, one. Okay. Which is what Ruby Rose says to Keanu Reeves in John Wick 2. When he's like, how many loose ends oh. do you have left? She goes, just one. Mm, yeah, okay. Because I watched John Wick 2 like two days ago again. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, it's a fantastic movie. I fucking love it. What is this anyway? Like, what do we want to talk about that? I think we should because it's going to go up <laughs> on our socials. So this is the fertility idol from the very first Indiana Jones movie. It's the little golden statue he steals. Oh, and then the boulder comes out. OK, him. yeah, 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 yeah. And the one that was in the picture looked really cool. And it was like glossy and reflective gold. And it had like realistic eyes. And I was like, hell yeah. And it was like 40 bucks. So I went ahead and bought it. Um, but I got wished, is that the, the way you say wish. it? Wish.com. I got wish.com and I got this piece of shit, which I think is barely worth 10 bucks. We don't need a fertility idol. We have fertility idols at home. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And this thing looks like shit and I, it, it, it makes you wait like three weeks before you can leave a review. Cause I got on at Etsy and on Etsy, you have to wait like three weeks to give a review. But as soon as I can, I'm going to give a really bad review because yeah. this is not what was in the picture. This is horrifying. She yeah. thick, though. The thing that, okay, the thing that bothers me the most yeah. is that, so down here, it's supposed to be a child, right? Right, right. But it looks like the, Being the caterpillar from Alice in Wonderland. Yeah, it's like, so there's the head, yeah. and that's supposed to be his two arms. That's not how arms work. But yeah, no, the head is completely detached, which is not how the original looks, right? right. And even the right. pictures I saw, that's not how it looked. It's just, right. this is so cheaply made. They don't give a fuck. So it looks like... His his hind legs, he's doing like an overextended bridge and his hind legs are coming over his shoulders. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what it, so it looks fucking awful. It's like a trap music dancer. Yeah, and I'm sure everyone at home will see it on our socials eventually, but it's, I, I got it and I was like, uh, I was going to put this on my mantelpiece, but it looks so shit, might as well just put it on our shelf. I mean, we talked about Indiana Jones. We did the yeah, Patreon that's what I was like, there's a like, loose fits. connection, so it why not? It doesn't look any worse than anything else on our shelf. We have Saddam right. Hussein on our shelf. <laughs> right. Right next so, to Michael Dorn and uh, Mutt. Were you thinking about names? I was thinking about Jezebel, maybe. Jezebel's a good one. I like Jezebel. Because she's just an ugly <laughs> looking thing. <laughs> well, I think Jezebel was supposed to be like tempting, wasn't she? I don't think so. In history, she was like, she was the... No, not she's, Jezebel. Boss ass bitch, no? She was a boss ass bitch, but I don't think she was known for her beauty. She was just a woman in charge, and she was she was not very nice. Anyways, this week's book is Nichibotsu no Senshi, or in English, The Sunset Warrior. Oh. The author is not Japanese. The book is not in Japanese. I just made it Japanese because the author has some fascination with, like, Japanese things. Sure. He's a very old-fashioned weeb, I guess, so... I was like, he, would, he might appreciate it if I put it in Japanese. He's a proto-weeb. Right. So it's The Sunset Warrior by Eric von Lustbader, I believe is how you pronounce his name. It's Austrian. Okay. My, my initial instinct was Lustbader, but no, it's, it's like Lustbader or something like Lustbader. that, right? This is a fantasy slash science fiction novel. It was published in 1977 Ooh, and is about, okay. it's about 210 pages long. Yeah, solid. Pretty uh, normal. This is 1977 par for, sci-fi fantasy. I dig it. I was going to. <laughs> so as a gag at the beginning, yeah. I was going to say this week's book is Orphans of the Sky. Uh huh. Because there are a lot of similarities. Oh, OK. Not so much that it's like there's no point talking about this book. Right. But, but it's, there are very clear similarities between this and that that collection of stories. Uh-huh. Uh huh. The reason that I picked this book uh, was the cover. Now, this is an organic pick. This is one of the ones that we, w we both went together to right. a used bookstore right. and picked out books. And this was one I picked just for the cover. Now, on the cover, it looks really fucking metal and badass. It's a dude uh, with a sword. Yep. Um, he's got some very 70s leggings. He's got 70s leggings and like an 80s version of 
a breastplate. That's like yeah. if you've seen any 80s sci-fi tech, they all mm-hmm. have like those plastic breastplates. Yep. It looks like that. I, I believe in the book it's referred to as a corselet. Sure. But I'd never heard that before and I didn't look it up. Nope. But I, I just assumed I was like, because they, they, they changed between breastplate and corselet. So I was okay. like, I'm assuming he knows what he's talking about. I don't know. Maybe he made up his own word. Maybe not. Maybe. I mean, of course it's a thing. I wouldn't put it past him. But and he's got a a badass sword um, next to it, like that he's holding at his side. And he has his left hand up uh, with like this green gauntlet thing. And it looks like he has six fingers. This was a very, very pointed nose. I fucking love the 70s style fantasy artwork for novels and stuff. That's like some of my favorite art. The only problem is you run into a lot of chainmail bikinis. Yeah, <laughs> which is basically it's what, to be honest, it's what this guy's wearing. But he has, he has, he has a, a dick cage. He does. He has a dick cage, a belt, and then a, yeah. a breastplate that does not cover his uh, stomach. Yeah, this is. But he's uh, wearing like a male chainmail bikini. Right. This is very borderline BDSM equipment. It's very close. Uh, and he's got a bit of a mullet, which is cool. Oh, yeah. Classic mullet. Something you can see on the back, which is like barely visible next to the barcode, is a hatch opening up with a skeleton coming out. See, I wasn't sure if that was like a hatch because it, it, it looks, it looks, it does. It looks like the top door, like the the top hatch of a submarine. Yeah, and, and there's electricity all around. So I, yeah. um, spoiler alert, that doesn't happen in this book. Aww. So a little, a little disappointing. But uh, yeah, so that that's why I picked it. And let's let's jump into it. The Sunset Warrior. We begin our book with our protagonist Ronan. Nice. Already starting with the cliches. Ronan the Barbarian. Uh, he's, he's not a barbarian. He's actually a fighter class. Very much a fighter. That's all he fucking does. Okay. Uh, so anyways. We heard you like fighters, so we put more fighter in your fighter. Right. I, I'm, I'm, all right. Already I'm jumping ahead here a bit, but we have Ronan. He's dying. Oh. But he doesn't know it. Okay. He's lying naked on a stone slab in the middle of a square chamber. And he doesn't know he's dying. No, he doesn't. He doesn't feel great, though. Yeah. Huh. Standing over him, prodding his body, is Stalig, or Stalig, I don't know, however you want to say it, the medicine man. Ooh. Ronan vaguely remembers being in a brawl. We have a flashback, uh, like he, he's starting to remember shit. Okay, yeah. So we flashback, uh, and it, it reveals that uh, he had been kind of just walking through town, and uh, some guys came up to him, and they were treating him like a, a student, which he isn't exactly. Okay. So he was rude to them. And, uh, and they beat the shit out of him. I mean, don't be rude to people who can kill you. Also, our protagonist, at first he would be like, he's not good at fighting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was six to one. Okay. But still, he doesn't seem to put up much of a fight at all. Get some more guys and it'll be an even fight. They're, okay, so the guys that confronted him were called Bladesmen. Bladesmen. And the leader was called a Chondrin. Okay. How do you spell that? Uh, C-H-O-N-D-R-I-N. That is so close to a Chandrian. I know. And I kept thinking that throughout this whole book. <laughs> Chandrian, the Chandrian. Um, so he's a Chon- Chandrian and his bladesman who beat okay. him up, right? And they'd beaten him unconscious. He woke up. He was in this, this place, right? Yeah. The medicine man tells Ronan to get dressed. Oh. Uh, and he seems to have doctored him back to stable condition, right? Uh, Ronan puts his clothes on and follows Stalig into an adjacent office cubicle. And it's cluttered with stacks of bound paper and medical paraphernalia. Mm -hmm. There they sit and drink wine and discuss the inevitability of war in Freehold. Freehold is where they are. Okay. It's it's a giant underground complex. Okay. Zion, hear me. Right. Except it's more techy. There's not like rock walls. It's like metal walls. Is it just a giant orgy? No. Unfortunately, there are no giant orchies in this book. Okay. Which I was really surprised by. That is is shocking. (laughs) They're talking about the conflicts that seem to be arising recently. Like you getting your ass kicked? Exactly. Because Ronan points out that that's not how bladesmen settle differences, right? Traditionally, if you had a problem with someone, Mm -hmm. you took it to the Hall of Combat and dueled. Oh. But they didn't. They beat him in public. Right. So he's like, they're surprisingly bold and breaking tradition, which tells me that, you know, there's something going on here. They're the new guard. So during their conversation, we learn that Ronan is a bladesman with no affiliation, any group. Duh. Because it's almost like, (laughs) it's almost like he's a Ronan. Yeah, exactly. Which is very unusual because every bladesman has like, you're a student. And then once you're a bladesman, you join a group Oh, or else you're like, toast you you get killed or something right you need yeah. you need protection yeah 
And you also need uh, goals. You need someone to serve. That's mm-hmm. just how their society works, right? Everyone has to serve in some capacity. Uh, he doesn't give a fuck. He basically became a bladesman and then just didn't do anything. Hmm. Kind of weird, but he's still alive. Hmm. Huh. Hmm. Hmm. We also learned during the conversation that Ronan's sister disappeared when they were younger. Oh, poor thing. Super sad. Not terribly important, but don't forget it. Yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, two security dagum appear outside the office door. God dagum. <laughs> that's what I was thinking. It was like so close to doggone or goddamn. Yeah. That's, that sort of thing. Um, dagum are like security officers, right? So this is, this is a position. Right. Okay. They're bladesmen, but right? they are specifically part of the security okay. uh, group okay. that handles security of the complex, right? And they're called Dagum, and they have daggers. They have, like, a belt across their chest full of daggers. Mm-hmm. The, very similar to Orphans of the Sky. Daggers are used a lot in this book. They throw them. They stab. They do all sorts of stuff with daggers. Nice. So two of these Dagum are outside the office, and they request Stalig's assistance. They're like, hey, we need your help. Someone is really ill. And so... Hey down there. Can you give us a hand with this? <laughs> And so uh, Stalig is like, why don't you just fucking bring him to my medical office, dumbass, if he needs help? <laughs> and they're like, well, we can't because he's a very important person and we don't want anyone to know about this. And so Stalig is like, well, I'm not going to treat anyone. I don't know the details. Yeah. Like, you got to tell me. So they are like, he's a magic man. See that man? He's a magic man. Uh, he's a magic man and he has gone mad and he's been restrained. He, magic. He had- Man. The magic man, yes. The magic man. Uh, magic men are basically the top of the top scientists oh. in this civilization, okay. right? Um, and they're like, he's gone mad. And he attacks someone. We've had to restrain him. We don't know what to do with him. Mm-hmm. You need to come treat him because we believe he's dying. So Stalik is like, okay, let's go. Yeah, sure. Why not? And he takes along Ronan because he has nothing to do. Why not? The Dagum escort the two to a heavily guarded chamber in the lower levels. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, Fallout vaults, got a bunch of levels. Yeah. All that, yeah. This is kind of similar. Um, they go down a bunch of vaults. They have to go down like stairways. There are stairways and there are lifts. Lifts are more specific. So like if you want to go directly from one place to another place, mm-hmm. that's more like what lifts are. There are a couple lifts that are more like elevators, but I, I don't know. There's some details of the book that are kind of vague, so I just yeah. extrapolate what I can. Yeah, exactly. But in this is, instance, they're just going down stairwells to lower levels, okay. and they have to carry a torch because it's dark in the stairwells or sure. something. So they take them to uh, a very heavily guarded room, and uh, one of the escorts has to like do a special knock, and then it opens, and they're allowed inside. It's, it's more like he hits like several different spots. Oh. It's, uh, yeah, it's interesting. He has to do a rhythm game on the door before he can get in. <laughs> Inside, they meet the head of security, Fradel. 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 I'm a Fradel. I can't help you. He is both a Chandran and a Sardin. I think you mean Sardine. It could be. I don't know. <laughs> uh, a lot of these things, I don't know how to pronounce exactly. So what's the Sardin? Uh, so Sardins and Chandrans are both just ranks, right? Okay. Sardins are the top. Uh-huh. Each faction is led by a Sardin. Chandran is the right-hand man of the Sardin, right? So is he his own right-hand man or is he the top yes. of one? Oh. Yes. <laughs> He's either smart enough and industrious enough he doesn't need a right-hand man mm-hmm. or he just doesn't trust anyone to be his right-hand man. He's the uh, the vice president of that company who yeah. trains the guy up and then abandons his position and takes his salary instead. Yeah, he's the CEO, founder, vice president, treasurer. And he gets the salary for all of those. Right. Yeah. He's, he just yeah. runs his own show, right? Interesting. Head of security, he's a bad motherfucker. You don't want to fuck with him. Sounds like a douchebag. He is. Okay. Uh, Fredel is very suspicious of Ronan, because um, he was like, I asked you to bring a medicine man. What the fuck is a bladesman doing here? I'm afraid of you. Stalig vouches for him. He's like, well, he's my assistant. You know, he doesn't have anything else to do, so he assists me whenever I, you know, go out to do this sort of thing. But we... He's not. He's not. He's lying. Okay. Why? So does Stalig like yeah. Ronan? They're buddies. They're buddies. Yeah. Okay. They're buddies. Okay. So this isn't just some random Sorry. medicine. Yeah, I didn't okay. set that no. up. <laughs> That's my bad. No, they're buddies. Um, they're they're okay. very, very buddy okay. buddy. It's it's not like he just healed them and then expected him to leave or anything. Right. He was All like right. he was like, damn it, Ronan, you get into some shit again. And I, I glossed over that because there's a lot of shit to get to. But yeah. that, they're they're friends. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. The magic man is there, tied down to a bed. Mm-hmm. His name is Boros. 
which funnily enough is like the alien villain from One Punch Man season one, I think. Oh. Boros. All right. Boros is unconscious and feverish. Stalig examines the man and finds a charcoal triangle on each of his temples. Hmm. His skin is yellow and uh, he's sweating very heavily. So he's a coward. <laughs> no, I think he's jaundiced. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah. Doesn't have a yellow belly, you know, that guy. Kind of. According to his tech, tech is a magic man's assistant. Okay. Okay. I, there's a lot to keep track there's of. There's a here. lot of terms here. Yep. According to his tech, Boros had, over the course of several days, uh, become an insomniac, just stopped sleeping, mm-hmm. and he became increasingly more erratic and irritated. Those two go hand in hand. Stalig tells Freydal that Boros uh, will live. Hmm. Uh, he administers a drug from his bag, and then he and Ronan leave, and he tells Freydal, I'll come back to check on him later. But he's good for now. Just mm-hmm. leave him restrained, okay? Don't be afraid of uh, also, it's not super important, but it does come up later. Freidel has a scribe with him at all times. Ooh. So no matter what is said around him, he has record of it. Dodi, take this down. And the scribe is the one giving the testimony of the tech who told Freidel, okay. right? They head back to the medicine man's office. There, Stalig tells Ronan that Boros uh, had been in that room much longer than the security sergeant claimed. Mm. Right? He was like, I saw signs on him that he had been there for possibly a week right. or more. right. Um, and they had used drugs on him, very specific drugs used for interrogation. Oh. Right? All right. So he's like, their story is bullshit. Yeah. They clear. want information from him. Well, it was always going to be bullshit. Yeah. And they're just making sure that he, he, he stays survives. alive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so very suspicious there. Yeah. I'm afraid we have a problem. So from this, they extrapolate that Freidel wants to know something specific. Yeah. Boros knows what it is. Mm-hmm. Boros doesn't want to give him that information. Right. There's a conflict of powers here. There's speaking of conflict, you're saying Boros mm-hmm. and I hear Boros, mm-hmm. but in my mind, I just hear Basu from the, <laughs> so, uh, the other book. Yeah. But, but I mean, Basu comes up later. Hang on to that. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the best headcanon I've had in a long time. All right. But we'll okay. get, we'll, we'll get to that. I'm, hey, I'm in. For those of you who don't know what we're talking about, check out our bonus episode on our Patreon. What was the name of the book? The Fat Ninja? It was called the Morbidly Obese Ninja. Oh, that's right. It was worse. Yeah, it was worse. Uh, Stalig tells Ronan about the den spots on Boros's temples. Mm-hmm. Den, was- D-E-H-N. D-E-H-N. And I'm guessing those are the, uh, the triangles? The little triangles. Yeah. yeah. Right when he starts talking about that, though, they hear footsteps outside and Ronan just takes off. He's like, hey, we'll, we'll talk about this later. Hmm. Because they're, they're both a little spooked. Yeah. yeah they're like, sure. this is very unusual, and we both just stepped into something maybe we shouldn't have. Yeah. This is dangerous. Let's talk about this later. Ronan uh, then afterwards runs into his only, his only other friend. <laughs> oh, convenient. He's got two friends, kind yeah. of. Uh, a Chandran named Niren. Niren. Yep, Niren. Niren. It's a really cool name. Together, they go to Ronan's quarters, right? Mm-hmm. He's got this little little apartment place. Ronan tells Niren all about Boros and Freidel. You know, all that dirty shit's going on. Yeah. During their conversation, we learn that uh, this society lives in a complex filled with artifacts of the ancients. Ooh. Their life support systems. <laughs> Keeping them alive underground. Okay. That, yeah. They, they don't really understand machinery. Sure. They just know that it runs, and it, again, like Orphans of the Sky. Yeah. They, they, they don't have any sort of religious obligation. or like, It's not exactly the same. It's just the way it is. Yeah, it's like, that's the yeah. way it is, and yeah. it runs, and it works, and we don't mess with it, right? Because we could break it, and right. we don't want that. Right. The den is one such machine. Mm-hmm. It's an ancient artifact. It is attached to the head, and it emits energy into a person's brain. Mm-hmm. The marks left behind are called den spots because they call it the, the den. I, right. I don't know why the den and the den, den spots. Yeah, yeah. They, don't, they don't explain why it's called the den. But this is this is information Niren is telling Ronan. Right. He's like, oh, those spots, den spots. I know what the den is. It's a machine that fucks up people. <laughs> um, Niren tells Ronan that there is dissension among the Sardin and that they need to find out what Freidel is up to. Mm-hmm. Again, more of the there's a shit brewing. There's yeah, a conflict hey, something here. else is going on. Yeah, we need to get to the bottom of this. That evening, uh, Ronan makes his way to the Great Hall for Sen. Sen uh, is the evening meal. I'm going to give this author just lost a star. <laughs> for going den to Sen. Well, a- among all the other terms. Also, the Great Hall, which is in every fucking... The Great Hall, but you're naming every single thing. It's too many names, Dude, man. We don't need that. It's too we many don't. names. You could just say the evening meal, maybe. Yeah. 
Um, the, the, the Sen is a sacred tradition. Mm -hmm. Okay. So every night, everybody on certain levels gets together and they all feast and it's a peaceful time and weapons are banned. You're not allowed to bring weapons in. You're not allowed to fight any of that sort of thing. Yep. It's chill. I like it. Yeah. So the great hall just has like a long line of tables, right? Sure. Just really, really, really long. There's a shit ton of people in there, uh, like thousands of people. Mm -hmm. And so when he arrives, he finds uh, his normal table that he normally sits at. And he sits between Niren, his friend, Mm -hmm. and Kareem, his girlfriend. Oh. Okay. And across the table are Telmis, Gafand, Besat, and Tomand. I've already made my point about names in this book. Yes. Uh, You want to get really mad? Yes. Three of those names don't matter at all. <laughs> Are they the three that he sits across from? Uh, all but one. Okay. <laughs> is Tomand. Tomand is the one. Uh, no. No. Oh. Bosat exact- is the one. It's No, it's Gafand. Jo- I, okay. That's the important one. <laughs> all right. All right. Okay. So Gafand is a scholar and Tomand is a near. He's an engineer. <laughs> they, that they, one at least I can understand. They call him nears. They call okay. him nears. Some things I don't know, like scholar. I don't know why that's just scholar. And then an engineer is a near. Call it a skull. Yeah, that, a skull. yeah that'd, be, that'd be awesome. I'm a skull and a near. Uh, so these two guys, uh, Gafand and Tomand, mm-hmm. get into an argument about the ancient machines. Tomand believes that the scholars are useless because they're unable to learn anything about the ancients. Right? That's the scholar's job is to learn. And if about, they can't do it, the, yeah, what's the they, point? Yeah, what's the point? Yeah. Because the, the, the place where they live... They really have no knowledge of it. So it's very much the, the, the same, I keep saying this, as the orphans of the sky. So it's just, it's just the place they live. No one knows why. Yeah, no one knows every, how they got there. Everyone forgot everything. Interesting. Because there was really no need to, to teach that sort of thing. Right. Because the life support system just kept them alive. Right. Like, it wasn't written for survival. It's so. good enough. Yeah. And, and also, I, a lot of the materials were destroyed by someone. Yep. The, the book doesn't go into how or who. There's not a whole lot of written material mm-hmm. or seemingly not a lot of written material. We find out later it's like a rich bastard is hoarding all the books. Yeah, yeah that, so, was, that was always going to be the yeah, case. But, uh, yeah, yeah. but that, that's the case. So, Classic. So scholars can't figure out how the machines work. And Tomand being a near yeah. is like, we need to take the machines apart to figure out how they work. Which is great. Until it's great. It's not. But then you don't have the machine keeping you alive. Right. <laughs> and, and Gafand is like, yeah, you're a fucking idiot. You're going to kill us all with that type of logic. Yeah. So they get into a little bit of a huff here, which is not good. You're not supposed to do that in Sen. Right. No. Sen is the peaceful time. It's very yeah. Dothraki. Uh, Ronan tries to sort of settle them down and end the argument. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's a fighter, so he comes off a little bit more abrasive than he should. Hey, sit the fuck down. Yeah. Like, he's, he's not very diplomatic. Yeah. He's like, you're both idiots. Now stop. They are. So Gafand ends up throwing hands with him. Oh. Once he says that, that's a big no no. Gafand is like, Why don't you mind your fucking business? And it comes over the table and they get into a brawl. Wow. Right? Yeah, out of nowhere. And then during the fight, Gafand stabs him in the shoulder with a dagger that oh. he had hidden on him. Oh, you done, boy. Yeah. So, uh, but Ronan manages to punch him out, right? Sure. So Ronan is like a really good fighter. Yeah. And most of the time, he allegedly, fights. though, we've seen no evidence. Exactly. <laughs> he's, he's supposedly a really good fighter. Like how the king is a good, wise king. Right. And, and so he when normally when he fights, he just kind of goes on autopilot. Yeah. Because he doesn't instinct he doesn't so. need to try. Most Ultra of the time. instinct running. But then as soon as he gets stabbed, like a, a switch gets flipped in him and he almost kills Gafan. Ooh. Like he has an opportunity to just fuck him up. Yeah. And then instead he punches him out. He controls himself. Right. Kareem, his girlfriend. Takes Ronan back to his place to stitch up his wound. Yeah. Um, because she is like a, a medical person. Oh, nice. I forget what they call him. They, they don't call her a medicine woman because she's in training. I'm going to call her a doc. So she stitches him up. Uh, Ronan is distressed because of that moment during the fight where he was about to kill Gafand. Yeah, he's, he's thinking, like, oh, no, I almost lost control. Right. And he's like, it was, he was just an angry kid who didn't know what he was doing. I can't believe I almost did that. Yeah. And then Ronan and Kareem bang. As they do. Because you know what is great for trauma? Sex. Especially the second time that day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> so they bang. Physical activity. Uh, later, Ronan is approached by two Dagum, who are there to escort him to security, Sardin Freidel. Gotta find, oh, to Freidel. So the, Freidel. Okay. So he's a little bit worried. Yeah. He's like, oh, shit. He knows I've been blabbing about this shit. Mm-hmm. When Ronan enters Freidel's office, where the security Sardin is sitting yep. at his desk, 
Uh, nearby is a scribe that we mentioned before. Right. He's just writing every like, Ronin takes five steps forward to the desk. And he's writing all this shit down. Uh, Fredel chastises Ronin for fighting during Sun. Yeah. Because he's security. He has yeah, to yeah, look after the shit. Um, and he makes an ominous warning toward the end of their conversation Ooh. about poking his nose into places best left alone. Well, all right. That's foreshadowing. Not very subtle. No. <laughs> he's just like, I don't want you fighting doing sin. Oh, yeah. And don't fuck with me. Yeah. <laughs> just like that's what he said. <laughs> yeah. So that's great. By the way. Fredo's scary. He has a false eye. Ooh. That always glitters in the dark. Okay. Shit. Yeah. That's very cool. The next chapter begins with, uh, oh, think about chapters. This book doesn't have chapters. It does have chapters, but they're not chat. I don't know how to say it. It's not like you finish a chapter and then it's like, and then chapter five. It's just another page over the word start again. <laughs> the, huh. the only thing to delineate chapters is it goes to the next page. It stops in the middle and then goes to the next page. Very interesting. Huh. So there are no numbered chapters. There are only pages. Right. So it's basically he's inserting a page break. Yeah. Essentially, I've never seen right. that in a book before, but, All right. but I mean, I dug it because I feel like chapter breaks kind of pull you out of the book momentarily. They can. Yeah. And this didn't. There are also I good places just, to stop though, too, sometimes. That That's true. Yeah. Uh, but, um, but it, like the whole book just felt like one fluid read. Interesting. It was very easy to read and I never felt like I was pulled out of the story. Yeah. So huh. I really appreciated that touch. All right. So the next chapter begins with Ronan in the hall of combat. Practicing his swordsmanship with Niran, hmm. his best friend. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't think anything bad happens here. I don't remember anything bad happening here. Okay, because last time we saw him fight, well, first he got his ass kicked and then he lost control almost. Yeah. Um, well, I'm just expecting a dead Niran here. I think the first fight with the, the guys in the, because he mentions that these guys just come upon him all of a sudden and yeah. he's in a crowd. So he doesn't draw his sword because he's afraid of hurting other like bystanders. Hmm. And these guys are just on him and start beating him. So it's like surprise attack. Can't draw a sword. He didn't like against six guys. He couldn't do a whole lot. I mean, it sounds like he's just making excuses. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's all I hear. Um, I hear best fighter in the world. I also hear bitch. Uh, it, well, as we find out later, he, he's more or less targeted like all the time. Sure. So, which I mean, if that's the case, just be on your guard. Don't go into a random crowd. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. He is making, he's a bitch. <laughs> well, I'll just say, <laughs> he's making excuses. There we go. So they practice. Uh, it goes swimmingly. They have a great time. They kiss each other. No. Oh. Um, no, they don't do that. Oh. Afterwards, they bang they, each other. <laughs> yeah. Uh, afterwards, they go to Niran's place and drink wine. Oh. Niran, since he's a Chandran, is like a couple levels up. Sure. From, you yeah. know, where, because it's status. Yeah. And his place is like a little bit more well decorated than uh, Ronin's. Mm -hmm. So they drink wine. Everyone fucking drinks wine 24-7. I don't know how they're not shit-faced all the time. Uh, they're drinking wine and talking some more. And they start talking about, you know, kind of each other's past, like how their lives have differed from each other. Uh, Niran, you know, graduated as a student, became a Chandran right off the bat. Yep. Because he's very talented. And, you know, Ronan was like, fuck all that noise. I don't like it. I just want to not do anything. Ronan has no motivation to do anything. Yeah. I have never related more to a character in my life. <laughs> He, he is like, uh, the, Ronan is the definition of wasted potential. Yeah. Um, it seems like it, which to a certain extent, he like could have gone far kid. Yeah. Like I but think what if I don't want to, I think everybody understands that feeling. Yeah, for sure. Because everyone has potential and it's very difficult to either find the motivation to realize it or yeah. to discipline yourself enough to pursue it. Yeah. It's very difficult. And it's, it's not like that's the one struggle in this book that I appreciate is that this, this thing where it's like, I know I could be so much better than I am and I can actually affect things for the better around myself, but I just like, why? Yeah. Like I, I'm trying to find a reason and purpose behind doing it. He needs to listen to some Hoobastank. <laughs> but no, that resonated with me. I like that. The rest of his character, I think is shit, but I like that one part yeah, of his character. No, that's, and that's different. That's, that's kind of interesting aspect from the, uh, sci-fi heroes we've seen so far who mm -hmm. have potential and are very quickly maneuvered into realizing it. Right. But Whereas no, this, this is, is somebody a struggle for him. Almost in where, where he's almost past that stage where he's had the opportunity to realize it and then chose not to. Right. That's very interesting. That's a good take. Yeah, I, I, I really like that. Uh, uh, but like I said, the rest of his character, I just don't care for. No. Yeah. It's he's he's boring and not likable. But there's that one part where it's like, I get that. Yeah. That resonates with me. I get that. So during their conversation, we learn that Ronan was trained by a man called the Salamander. <laughs> That's all I got. Shut up. I like it. 
I like it. Um, Why? Because it's cool. Is it's it? mysterious. Is it? Yeah. And he and the salamander did not part on good terms. Oh, no. Right? That's mm, no bueno. Ronan tells Darren about his meeting with Fredel and uh, that he saw some dagum uh, gathered around the tablets and he believes it was a map. Hmm. Oh, shit. I didn't, I didn't put that in my notes. Fuck. No, yeah, no when you he didn't talk to, about the tablet at all. <laughs> when he went to see Fredel, yeah. he passed a room and there was a bunch of guys around it looking at a giant tablet and there was carvings in it and he thought it was a map. Ah. So he, he, he tells Niren about that. I will say that I really fucking hate this author's writing style. I really enjoy the story. Okay. I hate his writing style. What what about it triggers you? So at the like at the beginning of every chapter, he does a thing where he will write for two pages, but you don't know where, who, or why. Ah. It's just like it's like, and then the man with dark hair looked and he didn't know. And the, it's like so fucking vague. Yeah. And then it's like Ronan grabbed. I was like, that was fucking Ronan. Why didn't you just say it was Ronan? Why are you like yeah. having me? So I had to keep backtracking to write notes because I'm like, I'm writing this down, but I don't know who the fuck this is. Right. And then in like one sentence, he'll lay out the who, what, where and why. And it's like Ronan was here because he needed to do. I was like, fucking Bruh. hell. And I had to backtrack Bruh. and like fill in the blanks. Yeah. So I can I can he, get behind you on that one. That's he horrible. Fucking does that through the entire goddamn book. And yeah. I hate it. I fucking hate it because it doesn't seem to serve a purpose. Right. It's, it's just, it's him practicing a writing style and that writing style is shit. Yeah. It's irritating. And it's like, I hate it. Um, so there's a lot of, there's probably some holes in my notes just because I w- tried to go back and find something and couldn't. Right. Or it's like, I, I like, I think I remember it was this way, but I don't know. It happens. So Ronan tells him about the map tablet and Niren is, is very concerned about this news. Right. Mm-hmm. After this, Ronan goes to Stalig's office and he meets, Sireg coming out the door. I'm confused because I don't remember Sireg at all. <laughs> all right. Is it oh shit! No, Stalig. Re- no, it's not Stalig. It is. It is. Okay. Sireg. It's a separate person. Okay. I, I did write it down in the notes. I just forgot because they are completely inconsequential. <laughs> There's a lot of that going around. Um, it's uh the the person's name is Sireg. Uh, he's just another student of the blade. Okay. You know, um, and he had been wounded in a fight with uh Darcet. Uh, who's also inconsequential, whatever. He was wounded. He was at Stalag to get bandaged up, right? Yeah. Uh, and he and this was a fight that broke out in one of the lift elevators. Oh. Um, which is, again, like, this is not traditional. This yeah. is very weird that yeah. random fights are breaking out. So that that just that's part of the book that's like, hey, here's some more of this. Pay attention. Right, this exactly. Hey, this shit. means something. Yeah. Uh, so he goes into the office. Uh, Ronan meets uh, Anir whose leg had been completely mangled by a large machine in the lower, lower levels, right? Ugh. And I love this fucking part of the book because the near is talking to him about what happened. Yeah. And she was like, yeah, I got my leg caught in the gears of a big machine. And all of the other nears took hammers to my leg to turn into pulp because they didn't want to hurt the machine. Oh, my God. So they demolished her leg until it was like spaghetti just pulled out. Oh. And they were like, there, now let's take you up and get you patched up. <laughs> I, I mean, I've heard, I've heard some stories about people who worked in factories mm-hmm. who there's one specifically where, uh, the guy like keeps a machete next to the machine oh, that no. he works at because it is better. If your hand gets caught, it yeah. is better to cut your arm than off to fucking die than to get pulled into the machine. And he has it just right there. Jesus Christ. I, I don't know. I don't know for sure if that is a true story or if that is what he was telling like it. a new hire to scare them into to scare, not exactly. fucking up. Exactly. But this kind of introduces to us that the machines at the very lowest levels are the most important machines. And right. They're, they're, they're treated with kit gloves. Right. So while he's there, Stalig redresses his shoulder wound and uh, Ronan tells him all about the brawl in Senna, right? Yes. He's like, this is how I got it. This is what happened. Stalig becomes panicked and begs him to forget all about Boros. Oh. He was like, dear God, for all of our sakes, yep. don't mention this shit ever again. Bruh, stop. Uh, Ronan is like, Nah, bro, I can't. I can't forget about this. I mean, you can. You totally can. You easily could. That is an option, always. Yes. Um, and he asks Stalig to take him to Boros. Oh, no. So that he can talk to him. That's not how that works. Ronan has some fucking balls. I mean, he's got a pair. Yeah. And, and I, I'm not exactly sure why he felt compelled to do this. I got the feeling that he is the quote unquote destined one to save everyone. So he just yeah. feels the need to do this. It doesn't lay out why he feels this compulsion. Hey, stop doing that. No, 
take me to the source of the problem. Okay. Uh, so time skip. Hmm. Um, not a huge one, but th- this book jumps around a lot. It's like he'll be talking to someone, and then the next paragraph, he's like, so it's like a month later. Oh. And he's, it's very random. Damn. Um, this isn't, it's, this is like later that day, I think. That's like, because he wanted to go see Boros. Right. Uh, while Ronan is at his quarters, his room. Yep. Uh, Gafand comes to the door. And this is the bro who stabbed him. Yeah. Uh, so Ronan welcomes him in. Oh. And offers him wine. And a gun. Um, but I, I think Ronan is very, like, he understands Gafand at, at some level. Yeah. He's like, I know you're just an angry kid and you really weren't trying to kill me. You were just lashing out for, yeah. for some, not because of what I said, but because of something that's bothering you. Right. He's very, un- he's like a fucking therapist in this scene. He's like very understanding. He invites him in. Gafand is like very sheepish. He's the biggest, like biggest, uh, the biggest brain that we've seen on one of our protagonists. Yeah. I mean, again, like th- it's inconsistent. Sure. Because he never acts like this towards anyone else ever again. Yeah. So Gafand is very sheepish and he begins sobbing and apologizing. Mm. He's like, I'm sorry, man. I don't know what I did. I don't know why I did it, but I'm so sorry, man. You stabbed me. <laughs> you motherfucker. I'm going to stab you with friendship. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to kill you with, with kindness. kindness. <laughs> uh, so Ronan forgives him. And he's like, look, I get it. You're, you're yeah. stressed out. You need a job and all. Look, you didn't even, it wasn't even that painful. You're fine. It's all stitched up now. Look, I'm not a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> like you. <laughs> so, um, and then they start talking after like, you know, forgive and forget. And then they just start talking in general. And Gafan tells Ronan that he has deciphered uh, the meager scraps of ancient glyphs they've been able to find, right. you know, the scholars. Uh, and he's learned the, quote unquote, the ancient's terrible secret. Mm. Right. So he's like, I have learned of a terrible secret that no one is supposed to know. That's why it's called a secret. Huh. Uh, and he tells Ronan that they are all dying. Oh. Everyone is going to die. I mean, that's life. Yeah. That, Ronan's like, yeah, bro. I, I know. <laughs> uh, so Ronan and Gafand go to Senna together, uh, arm in arm. It doesn't say that, but I just assume. Yeah. Because they're happy now. They're skipping. Uh, Ronan learns from Niren at Senna. Right. So they're all sitting together again. Right. So they're all at dinner. It's really awkward at first because <laughs> they're like, oh, you two Did, are. Yeah. Didn't you fucking try to kill uh, him? That and, was yesterday. And you almost killed him. And okay. So it's really awkward at first, but then they kind of get over that hump pretty fast. Now we're cool. So Ronan learns from Niren that Boros Tech, his assistant, mm-hmm. was actually one of Freydel's men. Mm. Kind of weird, right? Mm-hmm. Freydel had tried to recruit Boros in the past, but Boros had refused. I see. So Freydel sent a rat to learn what he could from Boros, right? Yeah. Which kind of makes sense why Boros attacked his tech. Later, it jumps forward again. Yeah. Uh, Ronan finds Stalig sleeping in his darkened office and wakes him. Hmm. Cause, and there's some talk about, like, Stalig is like, How oh, damn it, they're sending all of the Nears from the lower levels up here with severe injuries, and I haven't had enough help around here, and I can't get any sleep, you know? So he's, he's, this sounds like everyone I know who's ever worked at a hospital. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no. Uh, I, this is one of the reasons I never had any interest in working in the medical field. Yeah. It sounds like hell yeah. all the time. Ronan notices two Dagum standing guard at the surgery room. Ooh. Yeah. They, weird. They're watching you, man. Yeah, kind of weird. Um, but they don't acknowledge him or anything. Yeah. They're just standing there. Menacingly. <laughs> Stalik tells Ronan that uh, he will take him to see Boros now. Oh, this isn't a setup. So Stalik walks across the surgery room to the far wall. Yep. And he kind of reaches into like the shadows because it's not a very well lit room right now. I okay, I, I mean, I mean it's, it's all a surgery room. It should be well lit, but it's not. Well, at least the table should be. Yeah, but I mean, he's in the kind of the corner of the room where it's yeah. like all dark. And then he seems to reach in and kind of trigger something, and then a secret door opens. Ooh, yeah. Inside is Boros oh. lying on a bed, unrestrained. Dun dun dun. So at some point, Stalig moved Boros from the guarded chamber to this location. Right. Allegedly secretly. And he, and he tells uh, Ronan that he lied to Freydel. And he's like, look, he's getting worse. I need him close to my office so I can monitor him at all times. Right. Oh, so it wasn't secretly. So uh, that's why he's the guards now. Exactly. Okay. It wasn't secret. And okay. Freydel was like, if that's the only way to keep him alive, sure. Yeah. So he moved him up there. And Stalig could talk to him as much as he wanted now. Yep. Stalig informs Ronan that, that he has spoken with Boros, but his mind is too far gone. Mm-hmm. He, he doesn't give any useful information, just babbles. Ronan wishes to speak to him anyway. So Stalig's like, oh, okay, whatever. 
At that moment, uh, a messenger comes and tells Stalig that Freidel demands his presence. Ooh. So Stalig leaves Ronan alone with Boris in the room and instructs him to get out as soon as the Dagom are gone, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because they don't know that Ronan is in there with him. He right. kind of meets him at the door and he's like, right. you want me? Okay, cool. I'll just lock up and we'll go. Yep. And doesn't tell him about Ronan. Yep. Uh, Ronan wakes up Boros. Boros immediately begins speaking seemingly random gibberish. Artifact present. Exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, he mentions blue, uh, land, uh, brown earth, green plants, and space. Hmm. They're all, they all seem to be just dis- disconnected and yeah. here and there. But those are the important things he mentions that, that Ronan kind of latches on to. Uh, suddenly his demeanor changes and he says, It is coming. I have seen it. It comes to destroy us. They do not want us to know. It is their secret. And he's kind of like going crazy here. Hmm. At the climax of his insanity, Boros passes out on the floor. Uh, later, we jump again. Yeah. Ronan and Kareem are making out. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> at, uh, nice. at Ronan's place. And uh, they're talking about the magic men. While making out. Yeah, because Ronan is like, what do you know about the magic men? I don't know anything about them. So what do you know about them? Sure. And it's good pillow talk. <laughs> and she basically says what, you know, I already said, they're the top of the top scientists yeah. and they, they hold a lot of power, even though they're not technically leaders of any kind. Mm-hmm. Um, they're just really smart. So what do they do? They invent shit. Well, oh. they figure out the ancient secrets. They're basically elite scholars, right? Okay. Okay. So, you, I mean, you, when you're talking about magic men, you know what that gets me in the mood for? What? Sex. Okay. They bang again. <laughs> All right. I was trying to, there was like a Magic Johnson joke that floated through my mind. There was a... Uh, magic Mike. Yeah, Magic Mike. First uh, one's pretty good. Second one's trash. Uh, Ronan has a nightmare. Uh, and it's During about- sex? <laughs> no, it's... <laughs> they, they bang, fall asleep. He has a nightmare. Yeah. In the nightmare, uh, Freehold is collapsing. Oh. On top of him. And he dies. And then he wakes up. Because it was a dream. Yeah. Ronan decides it's time to see the salamander. Okay. 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 Say some weird stuff's going down. I have to talk to my old sensei. Yeah. Which she's referred to as sensei in the book. And I thought that was dumb as shit, so I didn't write it down. <laughs> okay. The salamander. <laughs> uh, yeah. Again, very Japanese thing. Yeah. Uh, Ronan recounts his first encounter with a salamander. So we have a, a memory flashback. Yeah. Here. He was a young man training in the combat hall when the instructor announced the arrival of a large almost gross looking man called the salamander there it is and (laughs) so ronan describes him i'm not making this up as a mountain of flesh and we know of another guy who was described as a mountain of flesh we do good old basu basu so my head cannon is the salamander is basu yeah he, no, roamed, totally. he roamed the, the, the floor of the planet yeah. until he found an underground vault, and there he became a master of, well, he was already a master of combat. Right, but now he became a teacher. Exactly. So that's, that, that's awesome. That's my headcanon. Yeah. Oh, Basu. I don't think Basu is nearly as smart as the salamander, but it was- Well, self- he had time to grow. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, he's, he's like, he, he looks kind of gross and, um, and he, he, in, he's introduced to everyone as like, he's the master of combat. Yeah. Which means- he is, he, he, so he's a Sardin, so he holds a position of power. Right. So the, the one guy, Freidel is the Sardin of security, mm-hmm. and the Salamander is the Sardin of combat. I see. So he okay. is responsible for training everyone in combat. Right. And then once they're training combat, there's the Sardin of security. They can go work for him if they want. To, right, you know, different sort of places, thing. that kind of thing. Yep. So the Salamander is essentially the most dangerous man in, in the complex. Seems like it, yeah. He's the best at combat. Yeah. He trains the best in combat. I taught you everything you know. I didn't teach you everything I know. So, and, and the salamander wears very lavish clothing, and he has jewels on and jeweled rings on his hands and stuff. Nice. Yep. He has jowls. Jowls. I appreciate a good. You know, I appreciate a good jowl reference. Yep. <laughs> uh, so the students are told uh, to make a show of their practice because the salamander is potentially looking for a new disciple. This is still in the flashback. Yes. Yes. In the combat hall. Right. So they were, they were practicing normally, which just right. Means but you, now the big boss is showing up. So you got to put on a show. Yes. Yeah, so the instructor was Do like, the best you can like, yep. Like make it look good. Yep. Because this is your chance to become the disciple of the great salamander. Yep. Ronan, uh, who normally rarely puts an effort in his fights. Yeah. He doesn't have to. Yeah. Cause he's so naturally good. He, he doesn't even think of the fight when he's fighting. Right. He's, his mind is always off somewhere else. He's not down to play this game. Oh. Because he is anti-establishment, right? You sure? He's like, yeah. fuck the man. 
because that's just who he is. And also, fuck the man. Uh, he's he doesn't want to play this game. He just wants so he he's giving even less attention to his opponent. Right. He's literally putting in the bare minimum of defense. Yeah. He's not attacking. He's not moving. He's just like parrying everything, and that's it. This grabs the salamander's attention. He can fight without fighting. Exactly. Yeah. It's like he is trying so little, yeah. but he is successful. That's natural talent. So that grabs his attention. So he comes up and Ronan's opponent says a greeting to the salamander and the salamander's basically like, shut the fuck up, you idiot. Yeah. Like, you can't fight. It's obvious you can't fight. So just shut the fuck up. Yeah. <laughs> so- like the salamander just shits on everyone except Ronan, who's mm-hmm. like, my beautiful child. No, oh, no. <laughs> you are amazing. <laughs> Kids, if a, if a large fat man comes up to you and calls <laughs> you my beautiful child, run. So he talks to Ronan and he's like, yeah, like you, you fight so effortlessly and you have, you know, such natural talent. Um, and then as they're talking, he was like, I see that you lack motivation. Yeah. Because Ronan is like, just fuck off, old man. That's I don't I don't want to be your disciple. Been the issue the whole time. Yep. And that's like, that's what the, 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 you know, you want what you can't have. Yeah, exactly. And the salamander is like, oh my God, you're like even hotter to me now. Oh no. Because <laughs> you rejected me. <laughs> Somebody call a hairdresser because I see some grooming. So the salamander tells the instructor and the other students to be like, all right, just get back the fuck up. Yeah. And then he tells Ronan, he's like, defend yourself. And then he pulls out a battle fan. Do you know what a battle fan is? Yeah. Okay. Kyoshi so, yeah. Warriors and Avatar and that kind of thing. And it's like a solid metal battle yeah. fan. He pulls it out. It's the first time I've ever heard those referred to in literature. Yeah. They're not that common. Um, the Salamander does have a sword on his hip, but he doesn't. He pulls out a fan yeah. instead. And in it's his like, way of saying, I'm a fan, Ronan. <laughs> so in a flash, he disarms Ronan like almost instantly. Yeah. Because Ronan wasn't prepared for a big fat man to move so quickly. Right. Because he's fucking Basu. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the salamander tells Ronan to report to his level in three cycles time. I didn't really mention any of the time things because there's like, there's cycles, which are days, I think. Yeah. There are, there's like spells, which are like an hour, I think. I hate it. Uh, and then there's another one for like a month that I forgot. But yeah, he's a like. Span. So he tells him in three cycles time, meet me on my level and, uh, and bring no personal items with you. Uh, and, and Ronan, even though he is not down for this, he's curious. Yeah. He's like, as you would be, this fat man is amazing. Yeah. And I could, I could be better at fighting if I learned from him. Um, we don't get any of Ronan's training with a salamander. It's just like, that's how he met the salamander. Oh. Current day. Uh, he makes his way to the upper levels to where the salamander's place is. Right. Cause he was, this, this is the part of the book where he's like, I have to go meet the salamander to talk about this shit that's happening. Right. Cause I don't know who else to talk to right now. Right. Uh, he comes up to uh, large, elaborate lizard doors. You almost had alliteration. And a voice on an intercom asks his business. Like, what the fuck are you doing? It's very like Return of the Jedi, Jabba's Palace thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and so he's like, I'm here to see the salamander. I'm Ronan. He told me, or, you know, I just had to speak with him. So he goes in. There's a woman behind the desk. She's like a secretary. And she's like, uh, the salamander's really busy right now. And he's like, uh, that's bullshit. Yeah. And you know it's bullshit. Yeah. And, and she's like, well, uh, no, nah, I'm afraid you'll have to come back another time. And there's like a moment where he grabs her by the wrists and like slams them on the desk and is like, I'm going to fucking go in there. And I guess power move. <laughs> yeah. Sure. And this like totally turns her on. Huh? And he just, he walks past her and it, it makes a comment about her just following his, uh, like following him with her eyes. And I wrote down here, uh, she finna tap that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, Maybe I, she's just into. The, I guess. That the, that's that the one thing, thing I hate about 70s fantasy novels. Yeah. Is that the protagonist, like everyone just wants to fuck the protagonist. Yeah. I don't like that. Yeah. So yeah, he forces his way past her. He goes through a hall and at the end of the hall, he enters a room full of men and they're all wearing like crimson uniforms with daggers over their, they, 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 uh, it's like a dagger shoulder that sheathed over their heart. Hmm. And then they also have a dagger on their hip. Okay. Uh, and one of them comes over to him. And this one is like, uh, it's like a rosy cheeked, fair skinned, uh, man. Okay. But Ronan says that he looks like he has never done a thing in his life. Oh, he's a rich kid. Yeah. That's, that's, that, that's his impression of him. Uh, I wrote in parentheses, bitch boy. There you go. <laughs> and so, uh, bitch boy beckons him to an adjacent atrium. Now, I say atrium, but there is no outside. Right. So it's a room that's treated like an atrium. It has yeah. very soft lighting that covers the entire ceiling. 
So it's like open air almost. All right. And there's a recording of bird song playing and there's like fans creating a breeze and there's like a flower garden. So it's like actually pretty cool. Trying to make it as outdoorsy as possible. Right. So in the center of the atrium uh, is a square pool, and at the far side of it sits the salamander. Oh. And next to him is, an, uh, is a vacant chair. Uh, Ronan joins him, and they begin talking. Uh, Ronan makes a snide remark about the salamander's chandran, Voss, the bitch boy. No, oh, yeah. Hey, bitch uh, boy looks like a bitch boy. Yep. And uh, the salamander is like, uh, you really don't, you never had like tact or politeness or anything like that. And then... While he's sitting there, two daggers come whizzing past either side of Ronan's head. Yeah. Just like, and then they both daggers strike the wall and then clatter down. And then Ronan kind of glances over at Voss, whose sheaths are now empty. (laughs) Is his answer, you missed? No, he doesn't say anything. He kind of shuts the fuck up. Oh, that would have been perfect. But that was the salamander saying, like, like, you know who we are. Exactly. Like, he's here for a reason. Like, don't fuck with us. Come on. Only now he's weaponless. That comes back later. Yeah, I'm sure him. it does. I know, yeah. <laughs> it's like, that, that's all I could think of is like, you threw your only defense away. Yeah, that's the whole point about throwing knives. Throwing knives are awesome. I got really good at it. Now you don't have a weapon. Right. What if yeah. you miss? What if he's not exactly 15 paces away? He does have a belt, though. I would just whip off my belt and start smacking the shit out of someone. <laughs> <laughs> um, Call me daddy. <laughs> uh, they talk for a while. And then the salamander orders Voss to open the lens. Ooh. So behind them, where they're sitting next to the pool, yep. a doorway opens. Oh. Or like Voss opens a doorway. Yeah. And Ronan didn't notice it before. And inside, it looks like it's pitch black. Uh, and it's like a very little room. So they all walk in there. And the room is only lit by small points of glowing green light. Nice. In the center is an ancient machine. Upon activation, holograms of the planet's surface fill the room. Oh. The salamander tells Ronan that the frozen wasteland they are witnessing stretches 500 kilometers in every direction. So the magic man was clearly mad. There is no green plants or brown earth or people living on the surface. And we know that 500 kilometers, while a significant distance, is not a lot of a distance. It's not a planet. And uh, they don't know that because they live in a cave. Or they, or they just pretend they don't know that. Yeah. So sometime afterwards, we jump again. Uh, Ronan is in the combat hall for training, and the instructor has everyone stand at attention. He tells Ronan to step into the combat ring. Uh, and then he tells the students that they will watch him fight a student from a different class. Oh. Which, uh, this is a normal thing. Like, yeah. they'll randomly pick someone and then fight another class. And different classes have different styles. Sure. Yeah. So he's like, this is an opportunity for us all to learn from another class yeah. or something like that. Um, and so he has Ronan jump into the ring and then he calls for Marksh. 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 Just Mark with a sh. Yes. All right. <laughs> Marksh. Now, he is mentioned previous in the book, but I just didn't put him down in the notes, but he is one of Fredel's Dagums. Oh. That's uh, one Ronan. Of bitch boys. Yeah. Ronan had met before. Yeah. And he steps into the ring with Ronan. Uh, Ronan spanks the shit out of him. Nice. He breaks his back. Holy hell. Yes. Because he's like, Fredo wants to send guys after me. I will tear them apart. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Because I'm fucking Ronan. And I'm also fucking Ronan. <laughs> Everybody cheers. Because the students like Ronan. Yeah. Most of them do. Because he, he doesn't take shit from anyone. He's the pinnacle of what they want to be. Exactly. They all want to be him. Nobody can. Yeah. And he's anti-establishment. And they're like, you're awesome. Yeah. Uh, so everybody's happy that he beat the shit out of Marks. Yeah. Uh, the instructor is furious. And he tells Ronan that he will report him and have him banned from all combat classes. Why? Because he beat the shit out of him? He, according to him, it was excessive force. No, oh, is there he like a code? His back. Mm-hmm. Um, but also because the instructor is just in Fredel's pocket too. Yeah, exactly. So he's like, it, it yeah, whatever matter. he does, if he loses, awesome. If he doesn't punish him. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and the combat classes are all Ronan has. Right. It's the only thing he enjoys doing. Right. Um, and so the instructor's like, I'm going to make sure you're banned from all the combat classes and never show your face here again. Ronan is ready to throw down on the instructor. Yeah, naturally. He's like, bitch, I could beat your ass right here, right now. Uh, but Niren is right next to him. And so he's like, eh, let's just go. Let's just go now. Don't make it worse. Or you're going to have like all of security on your ass. Yeah. I don't know where the fuck Ronan and Niren go to. They're in one of their places. Okay. But it doesn't say. But they're having wine and talking. Nice. Uh, Ronan tells him about his meeting with the salamander and all about the lens. Ooh. 
But Ronan doesn't believe that Boros was crazy. He has a bit of cognitive dissonance here. He's like, I believe Boros, but I also think that what I saw in the lens was real too. Mm -hmm. So I don't know what the real, what reality is. Yeah. I've been presented with two equally possible explanations. Uh, So Niren believes that there is a third power at play. Yeah. He explains to him there's like, there, uh, there's obvious conflicts going in here between the Sardans, but there's something else happening and yeah. I don't know what it is, but there is something underlying everything that's happening here. Uh, later after class, uh, Ronan is ju- after class. What the fuck? I thought he was banned. I confused myself in my own notes here. Hmm. Whatever. After class, I guess he's not banned yet. He was going to be banned. I don't know. But after class, Ronan is jumped by Korlik and his friends. Korlik was the guy he was dueling with when the salamander first showed up. Oh, okay. And Korlik is, has like a, he has grudge. a grudge. Yeah. Because he's like, I might have had a chance with the sal. Well, he didn't have a chance with the salamander, but he believes he did. Right. It but it was Ronan. ruined because of Ronan, even though it never was there to begin with. Yeah. It was never there to begin with. Yeah. So Korlik and his friends jump him after class. And so Ronan is like, they're, they're, they're going to take me somewhere. They're not yeah. going to fight me here. So yeah. I might as well just go with them. So they go to the combat hall. Oh, they're doing it traditionally this time. Nice. Like, I'm going to, I'm going to throw down with you. We're going to settle this. Ronan basically does what he always does. And he just puts in minimal effort and parries every single strike without retreating or attacking. Yep. He is just an immovable object. And that's all he's doing. And they do that for like 30 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and Korlik is exhausted and fucking pissed, and he just throws his sword down in frustration and yells. Yeah. And Ronan believes that was a signal, because at that second, all of his buddies just dogpile on Ronan. Oh. Not a good idea when he's holding a sword. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but they do, and Ronan just lets it happen, <laughs> I guess. And this he, is fine. He loses his sword, uh, but he's, he's like actually beating up these guys, which, I don't know, why couldn't you beat up the six guys in the beginning? I don't know. Yeah. But he starts beating up these guys, and he manages to get out of the dog pile. Korlik had picked up his sword again, and he mm-hmm. charges at Ronan, because he saw an opportunity. Right. Ronan can't get to his sword in time, so he turns it on. He is at full attention. He's using 1% of his power. Yeah. <laughs> He's going ultra instinct, baby. And he, like, fucking, somehow he counters Korlik and disarms him hmm. and just fucks him up and, and knocks him back. And then Korlik grabs his sword and Ronin's then sword. yeah Ronan's sword and then swings it at Ronan but Ronan blocks really sloppily and the sword is broken Ronan's sword which is Korlik's sword is broken right so Korlik has Ronan's full sword and now Ronan just has a broken sword oh I see okay 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 I thought I thought he blocked it with his arm not with I didn't realize he right, right, right. sword at this point right so Ronan has Korlik's sword mm-hmm. which is broken now mm-hmm. and Korlik has Ronan's sword which is fine yeah and so Ronan is like no biggie and just stabs him with the broken sword. Oh. <laughs> and Korlik dies and all of his friends scatter. Yeah. They're like, oh, fuck, we're out. And they take off. Huh. Uh, and then Ronan passes out. Why didn't you do that like half an hour ago? I don't know, man. I guess he just wanted to humiliate him. He didn't want to kill him. And then when it came down to it, he's like, I'm just going to have to kill this guy. I mean. But it's perfectly legal. They're in the, the hall of combat. Me. Yeah. It's yeah. perfectly legal. There's no reason. That's what to... you're there for. Don't go if you don't want to do it. Bitch boy. Uh, So he wakes up uh, and Kareen is standing over him and she's like making sure he's okay. Yeah. And he didn't like sustain. I think he had like a bruise from one of the guys hitting him or something. Sure. Uh, And so he updates Kareem on the situation and then uh, gets mad at her for crying. (laughs) All right. Okay. (laughs) Yeah. This was a real bastard moment. She starts crying because she's like, they're after you and you're going to die. And he's like, why the fuck are you crying? I don't like it when you cry. Stop crying. Like literally that's what happens. Ah, so yeah. I hate it. I do too. That was like a low point in the book for me. Uh, later, Ronan and Kareem are descending the stairs to lower levels, uh, and they have a, a, a fucking torch because it's dark yeah. in the stairways. Uh, and they come upon a collapsed section of the stairs. So the stairs kind of come to an end, and it's just a fucking pit now. Yeah. And they hear crying and whimpering. I told you to stop crying. <laughs> Uh, they find a disheveled figure in colorless rags. Ooh. Con- the way it describes it is very, like, golem-like. Hmm. Um, it's a woman. Okay. She's missing her right arm. Good Lord. Uh, and there's kind of a bloodied stump, but it looks kind of old. She's it's a not- former near. Ye- that, mm, you're right. I mean, I'm calling it. But- yeah, it's, no, she is. She's a near. She has a collar around her neck. Oh. With part of a chain, like a broken chain on it. Oh. And it has, like, things etched into it. 
It reads Korab near 99. 99 being the level. Hmm. Level 99 is the lowest level. And from this, Ronan extrapolates that she is one of the elite nears because mm-hmm. only the elite nears can go that low. That's the bottom floor. And that's where the, the most crucial machines are at. Right, right. We established that earlier. So while he's trying to communicate with her, uh, they hear sounds of men coming down the stairs behind him. Uh, and the men are like, Ronan, we know you're here. We know your girlfriend's here. We're going to fuck you up. Right? Oh. Uh, Ronan doesn't have his weapon on him. And his girlfriend's also not there. No, his girlfriend's with him. Oh, I thought it was just him and him and Tim and the disheveled near and his girlfriend. Oh, they, they were him and his I girlfriend thought, were going okay. upstairs. I thought I didn't realize it was his girlfriend that was with him. I thought it was his, the other friend. Oh, Niren, yeah, no, 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 no. Niren. It's, it's yeah, it not near, and it's Kareem. They he sees the outlines of four men, four Ooh. really big guys coming down the sort uh, the stairs with swords and a torch. Yep. Right. So he's like, "We're absolutely fucked." Yeah. There's no way I'm getting out of this alive. Um, but he prepares to fight anyways, because what are you gonna do? Yeah. But the near kind of jerks on his tunic a little bit and then points down at the pit. And he's like, uh, no, <laughs> we're not doing that. <laughs> we're not going down in the pit. Yeah. So he turns around and he prepares to defend himself. And all of a sudden, a small blurry shadow just shoots past him and bowls right into the four men, knocking all of them into the pit. Oh, the near woman had sacrificed herself to save him. Oh, uh, after Sen. So they just go have dinner and then, you know, <laughs> this is fine. Uh, Ronan goes to find Stalig, but his office is empty. Ooh. Gafand joins him at some point. I, when he's at the office, Gafand just shows up uh, and they enter the secret room where Boros was lying. Yeah. Right? Uh, Boros is no longer talking like a crazy person. He seems very coherent now. Oh, um, but he believes Ronan is one of Fredel's men and he yeah. won't talk to him. Sure. And he doesn't he doesn't remember Ronan. Yeah. But he's like, you're obviously here to interrogate me like the rest. I'm not going to talk to you. Um, but Ronan like just spills his guts, tells him everything that's happening. And he's like, look, we both hate Fredel. We're trying to figure out this shit. Let's work together. Yeah. Uh, then Boros trusts him and he starts telling him, uh, that he was building a machine that would enable him to gather information about the surface world. Oh, right. Okay. But the security sergeant, Fredel, didn't want him to do that. Yeah. Um, so he sent people to bully him. He sent a spy yeah. to like, spy on yeah. him. And so Boros is like, Fredel doesn't want anyone to know what is actually on the surface. So that this just made him work all that much harder. Right. He's like, I have to get to the bottom of this so everyone can know. Ronan tells him that he's seen the surface and it's all a frozen wasteland. Ooh. Uh, Boros. Right, because it was a hologram that he saw, right? Yeah, the lens. Yeah. That let him look above the ancient tech. Yeah. Uh, Boros informs him that they are actually located at the far end of the planet where it's always cold. Sure. But if they move up to the middle of the planet, it's very warm. Hmm. Science, bitch. Uh, Boros tells Ronan that a force is coming that will destroy everything underground and on the surface. Oh. But he can't be specific about it. Yeah. He's like, I don't really know much about it. Something's happening. I just know it's coming, right? Uh, And he tells Ronan he has to go to the 99th level because down there is where you can find information about this force. Yeah. Um, there's a scroll he has to find. Um, I don't know how Boris knows about the scroll. It's never explained. But he tells Ronan he needs to go find the scroll. Hey, look, it's real, I promise. I mean, he's a magic man. He can yeah. do shit. Uh, Boros draws a crude map for them uh, of the 99th level, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Ronan and Gafand uh, get on a lift, and they press uh, buttons until uh, it starts to descend. Um, it's a janky lift. And so they, the lowest they can go is the 95th floor. Ah. So they're like, we'll get down 95th and walk the rest of the way. Yeah. Um, the lift begins to go down, but then it starts jerking and starting and stalling. Right. Uh, until the cable snaps and the car plummets during this moment, we get a flashback. I don't, I, again, this author, I don't understand why he puts things in certain places. Yeah. It, it seems to jump around a lot. Yeah. It, this flashes back to when, Gafand and Ronan met initially, which confused me because I thought they met met in the uh, doctor's area. But I th- I think this implies that they met before going to the doctor's area. I don't know. But it talks about them meeting before getting to the lift. Like mm-hmm. they're together before going to. So maybe it was right after the doctor office. It's confusing. I don't know why it wasn't just linear. Yeah. But it flashes back and uh, it's Ronan convincing Gafand that he needs to follow him to the lower levels. Uh, Gafand is actually ready to go to the surface. Oh. Because he's like, everything is going to shit around here. I just want to leave. Yeah. Even if it means I die in the surface, I'm yeah. just out. And so he has a bunch of food packs with him and water and stuff. 
And then uh, Ronan is like, look, I want to do the same thing, but the other direction. Why don't you just come with me? Yeah. <laughs> Even though that seems like a worse thought. What if your idea, but opposite? Yeah. Uh, and so Gafan agrees. And then it comes back to the lift. Why couldn't you just fucking have that scene before Right, the exactly. There, there's, there's it makes no, no goddamn know. sense. I don't know. Like I said, I love the story. The author trying to read this book is fucking frustrating because I don't like the style. And it's kind of confusing to listen to. Yeah. And some, towards the end of the book, there are situations that are so fucking vague. I don't know what happened. Oh. And we'll get to that. But like, right. the, it's, it's really confusing. But uh, for right now, they're back in the lift. It's plummeting. At this point, Ronan remembers, oh, yeah, there's a button on the lift that turns on the brakes. <laughs> so, so he goes over, he goes over and smacks the button yeah. and the brakes activate and oh, they're, nice. they're stopped. Solid. Right. Uh, and then they, they pry open the doors and they get out of the lift. Yeah. And then shortly after they're out of the lift, they're like resting. And then the, the elevator brakes fail and just, <laughs> it like, you're right. Yeah. So they're making their way through the lower levels. They're on, uh, the 71st level. Oh, they got a ways to go. So they're making their way through the lower levels making their way. of Terrace. Um, <laughs> whenever there's underworld shit, yeah, I the lower city, the under city, yeah. um, they're, so the lower levels are scarred from explosions and collapses. Ooh. Okay. Which, which they're like, holy shit, it's going down yeah. under here. We had no ba, idea. Ba, da, ba, da, ba, um, ba. Uh, Gafand almost falls into a pit, uh, but Ronan saves him. Nice. Now, this, is this just Gafan and Ron, Ronan? This is not yes. Kareem? Yes. Okay. Kareem is not with him. Th- this pit that he almost falls in, it's the dumbest fucking thing, because they come to a pit, and Gafand is like, ah, oh, there's a pit. We should find another way around. Yeah. And Ronan is like, nope, there's no other way around. We got to go across. Why, though? Yeah, I know. It's like you, but you don't, you don't know. Yeah. You could literally go a, through a, other passageways. There's yeah. a lot of them, but he just tells Gafan, he's like, there's no other way we must cross. <laughs> and Gafan almost dies, but Ronan saves him. Okay. All right. And then Gafan is like, this is stupid. I want to go back. Yeah. Naturally. And, and Ronan is like, there's no going back now. We must go down. It's God like, damn it. Fucking Ronan. What are you talking about? So as they're going, they encounter a bunch of different workers like Nears that are down there. Yeah. So as they're going through the lower levels, the, the lower levels are kind of their own society. It, it's like uh, all of the engineers that work down there have their families down there. Oh, and they okay. Fucking live down there. As yeah, well. yeah, yeah. So as they're going through, they're meeting some of these people, and these people have gone fucking insane. Mm-hmm. They're killing each other. They're saying it's like everything is crumbling, and because they're the ones that are seeing the machines failing, right? And right. they're like, "We're all gonna fucking die." And they wow. go, they go insane and start killing each other. Okay. And the people in the upper levels have no fucking idea, right? Exactly, because they never interact with each other, right? So they run into a, and and this is, um, they they have a couple of like misadventures where they run into someone, and then there's a situation, and then they resolve it. Sure. So I'm not going to go into detail, but it's, it's grim. It's gory. It's, um, uh, there, there was a woman who like a, a little girl runs to them for safety. And yeah. then a woman comes out of nowhere and it's her daughter. And she's like, you fiends are not going to take her again, uh, into a dark room or whatever. Something like that. It's like, yeah, really dark shit. You yeah. know? Um, and I think later, uh, there's another woman who has her son and then she sees them approach and she just fucking slits her son's throat. Better than that he die oh exactly god it's it's fucking dark that's horrifying yeah so gafand is like bruh about to pass out yeah he's like he's never seen such a hellscape like yeah this. and ronan seems mostly unaffected all right he's a soulless individual okay eventually they find a lift that'll take them the rest of the way so they get in they hit the button and it goes down without a hitch they make it all the way to the 95th nice yep upon exiting the lift they step onto a grill work scaffolding it's like a big catwalk. Okay. Okay. And okay. it's this massive open area. And looking over the railing down below, they see giant geometric shapes. Ooh. These are the great ancient machines that are Ooh. keeping them alive. Right? Very cool. The only ones down here are the best nears. Right. They navigate their way to the 99th level. So they follow the catwalk down some stairs and down, 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 down. Um, the whole time, uh, they have to dodge Dagum uh, patrols and sure. nears that are working on the machines. Sure. Right. Uh, I say working on, but they're literally just observing machines. <laughs> like, they don't want to do anything to them. Right, because they don't want to stop the thing. Right. They're literally just troubleshooting how to, because uh, they, they overhear them troubleshooting power distribution. Mm-hmm. They're like, oh, power on level two is finicky. Let's try doing this to level it out and that sort of thing. Um, finally, they reach the machine that's marked on Boros's crude map, right? The machine is, for the most part, featureless, except for a big wheel. Ooh. Like a uh, kind of bulkhead wheel, handled wheel, you know what I'm saying? No, what? A, like a bulkhead in a submarine. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. That, that kind like, of Like the hatch on the cover. Exactly. Yeah. Just like that. 
Uh, and so Ronan runs up to it and turns it, and uh, the whole thing seems to pop out mm-hmm. from the wall, and it's fucking door. No, oh, so like sweet. So it is. Yeah, yeah. sweet. They, they jump in and close it. Uh, inside, it's just darkness. So they light a torch that they brought with them. Yeah. And they're in a very long oval tunnel. So they're like, oh, fuck, man, let's go. And it goes deeper. Ooh. Under level 29. 99? What did I say? 29? Yeah. <laughs> level 99. Uh, technically under ni- 29 as you, well. You are, you are correct. <laughs> so they walk down this really long tunnel. Yeah. Uh, and eventually it is filled with phosphorescent lichen. Ooh. And they don't need their torch anymore. Just like pitch black. Uh, yeah, yeah. So they, they put out the torch. It's just the best of. It's Yeah, it's like a, a mix match of all sorts of shit. Like a basu? Uh, so they, they put out their torch, and they're just following the glow of this lichen. Uh, at the end of this tunnel, there is... At the end of the tunnel, it opens up into an enormous cavern. This is no longer metal. This is rock. Mm-hmm. And the whole time they were walking down the tunnel, they heard this like droning noise and it got louder as they got to the end of sure. the tunnel. And then they open up into the cavern and there's a gigantic waterfall shooting out a cliff face Ooh. down, down, down to a river far below them. Down, down, down to Goblin Town? Yep. Uh, and they, so there's a path that kind of goes along the cliff face behind the waterfall and shit. So they follow this. Of course there is. Uh, and they keep following it through these caverns. Uh, and then the lichen starts to recede Ooh. as they go, right? At this point, I think it's been like two kilometers or something. They've gone quite a ways. Sure. And so the lichen is receding. They have to pull out their torch again. At the end of this path, uh, they find a ramp uh, that leads down to an avenue, like a cobblestone avenue. Interesting. And as they get to the avenue, their torch starts lighting up buildings. Endless buildings. Huh. Uh, and these buildings are very bizarrely shaped and constructed and coordinated. It's kind of, it's like a Dr. Seuss book almost. Yeah. Like structurally they make sense, but they're very odd and like artistic and just very, nothing they'd seen before. Cause right. the complex is very practical and militaristic. Right. Of. Exactly. And then this is like artistic expression. <laughs> like it's very decorative huh. and shit. Uh, Gafand whispers in awe, the city of 10,000 paths, the place of our forefathers. So Gafand, being a scholar, knew about this place. Yeah. There was mention of it. I mean, but it's, it's not exactly hard to find. Well, if you know that the one machine is actually a door. That's true. That's true. Because it's a machine. They don't know what it does. They don't want to fuck with That's true, and they don't the want to mess with it. No. Yeah, you're right. But then you're someone right. figured out this is a door, and that was Boros. Boros figured that out. You're right. Okay. No, that makes, that makes a lot more sense. And that was the information that Fredel wanted. Right. But Boros wouldn't give it to him. Um, the information that there is another way out of this place other right. than the top hatch, right? right? So city of the 10,000 paths, you said? Mm-hmm. Nice. The place of our forefathers. They carefully make their way through the abandoned structures. And this is very, very, very unclear mm-hmm. because it acts like they are not underground anymore, but they're not on the surface. They are definitively not on the surface. Right. But they're is also... Just, is the cavern just so big that it the Im- seems like they aren't? The impression I get is this is like Casa Doom. Okay. It's yeah. like massive. Yeah. And there are holes in the roof to the surface. Aha. Uh-huh. But it, it's so far away that it's a different climate down there. Right. It's very odd. And the author is not specific about this. <laughs> All right. But it's neither underground nor is it on the surface. There's literally sunlight that comes in to this place. Interesting. Right. But at the time they're getting there, it is just light enough that they can see around, but not in any great detail. Like sure. the torch is what gives them the detail, right? Yeah. Um, they both hear a noise and they draw their swords and turn around. It seems to be coming from a two-story house behind them. As they approach, they hear a coughing noise coming from inside. They go through the front door and the room inside is black, pitch black, except for two red eyes Ooh. on the far wall. Ominous. All of a sudden, off to their right, a bright light flares to life, and they see a small man holding a torch. Hmm. This is not where the red eyes came from, by the way. Okay. That's what I thought, but no, it's a, it's a little man separate from the red eyes. All right. He's like three foot high. Oh. And he has like a beard. He's very old. One leg is shorter than the other. All right. So he kind of hobbles as he walks. The little man walks over to the red-eyed creature. Mm-hmm. So now they see the creature, and he says, ah, ha, 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 ha. Hind guards the way. Hind is spelled H-Y-N-D. Interesting. Uh, so the creature uh, is very long. It's like kind of the size of a dog. Sure. But they don't know what dogs are. Right. So it's, it's long. It has four limbs. It's long and dog-like. Right. It's both scaly and furry. Okay. 
That's interesting. It has a long snout that is also its mouth. Okay. And it appears very rat-like to them. Interesting. Uh, the man introduces himself as Bonadus. Come on, Bonadus. I, that Everybody, might be. Let's go. That might be Bonaduce. I I don't know. Like I said, the guy's Austrian. I don't know how the names are supposed to be pronounced. We're gonna say Bonadus. I like Bonadus, yeah. so I'm gonna say Bonadus. Uh, he is called Bonadus the Last. <laughs> That's depressing. It's a fuck. I think it's a badass name. I like that. It's depressing, but yeah. <laughs> He is very hospitable to them, and he gives them food and drink. Nice. And he's like, you, will, you shall rest here for the night. Aw, nice guy, Bonaduce. Yep. He explains that Hind is a hybrid animal. He's a cross between a rat and a crocodile. Oh, ratodile. Ratodile. They don't know what a crocodile is. But right. He's like, it was a scaly. Yeah, trust me. It was a scaly beast that was once seen as a god. That's what he says. Uh, he also says that he knew of their coming because Bones told him. Oh, nice. The Bone Doctor. And they ask who Bones is, and he's like, ah, oh, never mind. So they tell him that uh, they're in a hurry. They can't, they, hang, they can't hang out. You're right. They're like, we need to find a scroll right Hey, now. by the way, we got to go. Yeah. But he informs them that the darkness is falling, and bad things come out after dark. Oh, nice. So it would be wise for them to stay there for the yeah. night. Uh, and they must rest, because they're weary. Uh, Ronan wakes up in the middle of the night, so they went to bed, and he wakes up later. Sure. Uh, and Gafan is still asleep, and Ronan hears the sounds of clicking and clattering. Uh, horrifying and he kind of follows the no oh uh, there's also a bit about hind like staring at the door and like at attention mm -hmm. and ron is like what the fuck's gonna come through that door and then hind just calms down and goes back to sleep so he's like oh fuck i guess that was nothing but then he hears the click clacking and then he goes upstairs and there's two rooms and one of them is uh bonadus and he's kind of kneeling on the floor and he has something in his hands mm -hmm. ronan goes over to see what he's doing and he sees that he has a bunch of little bones yeah 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 he's Casting the bones. Yeah. And he explains to Ronan that he's using the bones to see the future. Nice. Uh, which I don't know if anyone's familiar with that. You throw bones, how they lie, tells you things about the future. Sometimes they have carvings on them. Sometimes they don't. Right. Uh, there, there are runic carvings on these ones, by nice. the way. Um, and so Ronan is like, that sounds like horse shit. Uh, and then Bonadu says something about Ronan that like hits a nerve that he couldn't have possibly known. And then Ronan like kicks the bones across the room and then goes back to bed. Yeah. Uh, bones got power, yo. Yeah. Uh, the next morning, Ronan wanders away from the house. You got, mutt, you got power. <laughs> the next morning, Ronan wanders away from the house. He uh, said, I know. <laughs> and he's just kind of exploring around the city a little bit. Mm -hmm. Not going too far, but, you know, exploring. Yeah. Uh, and Bonadus talks with Gafand um, because Bonadus knows a lot. Gafand is a scholar. They have things to talk about. Sure. He tells them about the creation of the city of 10,000 paths. Oh. And he says there were once great scientists and great mages and they would vie for power and influence but at one point they being people people had destroyed right. the surface and they needed to move underground so the mages and the scientists got together and worked together to make the city of 10,000 paths oh and presumably all the strongholds around the planet where people live right in. right um which it is mentioned that they know about other strongholds but they've never been to them oh and they just they assume that everyone in them is dead which they have no proof of. I don't know. Sure. It's weird. They, they don't go into that at all. We're the last ones. How do you know? Because we're the only ones we've ever seen. Yeah. Uh, and then during the conversation, Bonadus kind of gives them some neat magnets to play with. <laughs> He's like, bro, these are magnets. Check this out. This is sick. Watch this. And then they like, <laughs> imagine the, like the, the little silver ones that you see in yeah, the but, little decorative offices, that kind of thing. These ones are like really big spheres. Apparently. Oh, they're like baseball size spheres. Oh, uh, Bonadus talks about evil things coming into being since the people have left the surface. Mm -hmm. It's like without people on the surface, evil things can grow and be created and that sort of thing and wander around. Uh, he himself lives on the surface and only comes to the empty city when necessary. He came down specifically to meet them because the bones told him about them. Oh, nice bones. Uh, Gafand and Ronan ask Bonadus where they can find the scroll Boros told them about. Uh, Bonadus tells them it will be in a green brick house in the city. And kind of gives them instructions where it is. Very specific. Because oh, he's like, okay. it, uh, uh, this will no doubt be in the house of a great mage that used to live in the city. Yeah. And he has a very unique looking house. It'll be easy to find. This is where you go. Part of the way they have to go goes through what is called a dark sector where the sunlight does not touch. Uh-huh. They have to go through the sector. There's no way around it. Yep. It's, I mean, it's a big city. Why, why can't you go through a fucking... I imagine it's like a strip. Maybe. I don't know. Again, light on details. Yep. So they're off. They have supplies. It's they, they got daylight to burn. They start heading that way. And they basically follow 
the avenue till it like comes to a, a fork and then mm-hmm. they take one way and keep going and then they reach the dark sector mm. and it's very gloomy very spooky it's just where no sunlight is hitting right so they have to like use a torch again um but it's like still open right so it's yeah, very it's dark the city gloomy, but it's just still open unlit. yeah as they're walking through the dark sector uh they start hearing a soft melodic chanting it's very faint but as they continue the chanting grows louder and they begin feeling physically affected by the chanting they see movement out of their periphery, but whenever they look, there's nothing there. Oh, man. Movement in the windows of the buildings around them. Yeah. As the chanting grows louder, they begin feeling panicked. Gafan starts heading towards one of the buildings all of a sudden. Like Bro, he's why? being drawn to it. Bro, stop. So Ronan grabs him and starts pulling him along behind him as they're running, right? Fam, we gotta go. The chanting just becomes so loud, it's overwhelming, and they start feeling weak and disoriented as they're yeah. running. They hear a shrieking behind them somewhere. Oh. And they start seeing stone creatures lurking in the windows and around corners and alleys and shit, right? Huh. Ronan can see the light of the cross street up ahead. Okay. He's like, I see the light at the end of the tunnel. We just have to make it there. We just gotta go. He keeps moving. He keeps pumping his legs, but his vision is failing. And he hears a voice from far away as if... It's coming from some bright land yelling at him, get out. This whole scene is very vague and I don't have answers for any of this, huh. but it literally says a voice from some far off bright place tells him to get out of here. I imagine you hear, I, in my mind, it's the voice of the, uh, uh, it's Galadriel. Arriva Derche. Arriva what? <laughs> What's his name? Bonaduce? Yeah. Bonaduce. Could be. I saw it as a very like Frodo and Galadriel thing in mm-hmm, the, in mm-hmm. this darkest moment, a light will shine yeah. and he's like, you have to go. You have to keep going. You can't stop here. Um, he, with the last of his strength, he makes it over the threshold into the brightly lit yeah. cross street, and they collapse and they're panting and breathing hard. Uh, after they rest for a short time, they are attacked by five creatures. Oh. These creatures are the same as hind. They're hybrid oh, okay. animals, yeah. right? Um, it's pretty boring, but they kill them. Are they, are they the same? You said so they are rat. Yeah. Rat, rat crocodiles. Rat okay. But they're, they're okay. feral and yeah. nasty. So they kill them. Um, and they continue on uh, a little shaken because that was their first like hostile encounter. Right. Uh, in, in enemy territory. Uh, as they walk past the many houses, they see a lot of squinted, fearful eyes peering out of the windows and doorways. At oh, them. not like evil creatures or animals, but like people Concerned that citizens. live there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, interesting. They turn a corner and they see the green brick house (gasps) in the middle of the street. At that moment, they are attacked by a giant scaly, but intelligent creature on its hind legs, wearing a cloak. Ooh, this comes out of fucking nowhere. Um, he just comes out of a doorway and he's like nine feet tall. It's a dinosaur. Yeah. It's fucking, it's King K rule out of nowhere. (laughs) Comes down on these fucking monkeys. King K rule out of nowhere. (laughs) And, uh, call it an RK rule. And this thing is business. It's Mm. huge. It's muscular. Ronan immediately attacks it with a sword. But when he hits him, there's this feeling of fiery pain and spasm that hits his arm like he's being electrocuted. And he has to use his offhand to pull the weapon away from the creature so it stops. Interesting. Yep. I dig that. And then when he strikes it in other places, because I think he's struck it like on the cloak. Okay. Again, it's not specific, but when he strikes in other places where it's like scaly skin, it just doesn't do anything. Mm-hmm. It just glances off like it didn't even leave a scratch. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this creature is not in a rush. It doesn't seem scared of them or threatened. It just kind of smacks them around a oh, lot. No. Come on, lads. It doesn't talk. It has uh, like orange eyes with slitted pupils. Nice. It has like a beak mouth. Okay. Uh, during the fights, I think a fan, uh, like tries to strike it in the face and it literally grabs the blade and just crushes it. <laughs> so it's like the blades mean nothing to it. And yeah. It just destroys the blade. Right. And they're both knocked unconscious. I am like confused as fuck at this point because sure. there's some language that I think is like poetic license, but it confused the fuck out of me. Oh, okay. Because it says Ronan is thrown down a pitch black stairwell. Okay. But not literally. What? Exactly. <laughs> It says that, but then he wakes up and he's not down a pitch black stairwell. He's just in the street. So I don't know what the fuck happened, but he's knocked unconscious. And they also mention a well being nearby. So I thought it was like, wait, did he get knocked down the well? But then he's not. He just right, wakes no, up in the, in the street. So he wakes up 
they're both alive and for the most part unharmed. They're beaten up, but they're not cut or split yeah. open or strangled or anything like that. And the beast is gone. Hmm. Yeah. So they're like, wow, that was weird. Anyways, let's go to the greenhouse. <laughs> Literally. They just like, well, All right, on. let's go. There couldn't be I mean, a what reason. What else are you going to do? I mean, there couldn't be a reason it left us alive. Maybe yeah. to follow us. Uh, so yeah. anyways, <laughs> it did seem like an intelligent creature. It wasn't a monster. Man is the real monster. So when they go inside the house, it yep. is very lavish and ornate, Ooh. right? It's like a, a top tier mage lived here. Yeah. Is a, like, it might as well be the president's house. So they begin searching for the scroll. Uh, and Gafan takes the first floor mm-hmm. and Ronan takes the second floor. Yes. Split up. So Ronan, as he is looking around the second floor in one room, he sees kind of a flash off his vision and he looks over and there's a mirror. Oh, so he goes over and he stares into his face in the mirror. This was a very confusing and trippy part of the book. And I'm not going to put down a lot of details because I think most of them don't matter. He basically has a vision like Frodo looking in Galadriel's mirror. Oh, he sees a lot of shit that's really confusing and trippy and doesn't make sense to him. Um, he sees like a weird building. He sees like an armored soldier of some kind. He sees Kareem, but then she turns around and it's his face. He sees a giant black bird. A lot of shit, right? Huh. And he's standing there doing that. And Gafan kind of walks into the room and he's like, well, it's not on the first floor. What the fuck are you doing? (laughs) And then Ronan looks over at him and then he looks back at the mirror. It's not a mirror. It's a flat plane burnished like unreflective hunk of iron Mm. it's just a big iron plate Mm. yeah Mm. and he shrugs it off as like well we are in a mage's house i mean yeah that's fair that's (laughs) that is a logical reaction there uh so they continue searching yep uh ronin is still in the same room and gafan goes to one of the other rooms Mm and the second floor and then shortly ronin he finds a miniature building Mm. it's like a little miniature and it's the same building he saw in the vision oh So he starts snooping around and he sees a glint of like yellow paper under one of the floor tiles of the miniature. Okay. So he starts poking and prodding around this miniature and with his dagger, he's able to pry out like a bottom piece or something. And with it comes like a sheet of paper with a bunch of glyphs on it. Mm -hmm. And then he calls Gafand and Gafand was like, that has to be it. Yeah. Let's get it and go. Let's get out of here. As soon as they exit the house, who do you think they run into? King K. Rule. King K. Rule. Hey. He, he fucking blind signs them and starts smacking the shit out of them, right? I told you twice. <laughs> uh, so they're getting their shit pushed in again. And Ronan makes a desperate stab at the creature's gaping beak. Like it opens its mouth to roar at him. Mm-hmm. And he's like, Lah! and then he just stabs him in the, in the mouth. It works. Huh. The, the creature starts screaming and then drops them both and just takes off. Uh, he passes out. I was just trying to have fun. <laughs> Screw you guys. So they both pass out. Ronan wakes up and he is in a giant pool of black blood. Oh, nice. Uh, presumably from the creature. Yeah. But the creature is long gone, right? Gifand is dead. No. Oh, no. His throat is both crushed and torn open. Wow. Yeah. So Ronan picks up his body, goes back to the well they were next to and throws the body down the well. That's, Why? That's not cool, by the way. Why? Like, you don't fucking live here. Don't do that. <laughs> Why? I don't know, but he does that. Uh, and then he returns to Bonaduce's home. How the fuck did you get back through the dark sector, motherfucker? Now nah, they knew he was leaving this time. Okay. So they <laughs> were fine with it. Sure. I think literally in the book, it just says he doesn't know how he got back, but he did. Fuck you. All right. Fuck you. I don't know how I was supposed to write him getting back through this, so exactly. I did. So, uh, so Bonaduce doctors him back to health. Um, he gives them like, he gives them a goblet of water and puts some brown powder in it. He's like, drink this motherfucker. It's just brown sugar. (laughs) Ronan passes out again. Yeah. He does that a lot. He passes out and he gets his ass kicked a lot in this book. Yeah. Which I also fucking hate as that's a total crutch in writing. Yeah. Character passes out and wakes up. Yeah. I fucking hate it. So he wakes up and Bonaduce is gone. And so is Hind. Oh. And there is no sign that he ever lived there. Oh. Everything's gone. He dreamed it all. Oh, no. I'm I'm kidding. The only thing left there is, uh, I think the furniture is still there, but whatever. Everything else is gone. On a table next to the chair he's fell, you know, fell unconscious on is a gauntlet, a green scaled. It's actually like silvery, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's it's a gauntlet. 
And he's looking at it, and it appears to be made of the skin of the creature that he had fought. Oh. And it is at a six fingers. Yep. Bam. There That's it is. why he has a six fingered gauntlet in the cover. Yes. Uh, no explanation for why the gauntlet's there, where it came from. <laughs> it's just there. Because he didn't chop the creature's hand off. Right. He, he stabbed it in the throat. He didn't kill it. In the inside throat. So somehow Bonaduce just has this gauntlet, I guess. Because yeah. he maybe he killed a creature in the past. And he left it there for Ronan. Now remember, this, this scaly skin is completely invulnerable to blades. Right. So Ronan is like, hell fucking yeah. And puts that shit on. Yeah. Um, he needs to head back to Freehold. Right. Cause Mission he's, accomplished. He's got to go. Yeah, he's going to blow the doors off of this shit. Yep. Uh, Ronan is just back in Freehold now. Okay. It, I mean, it, it was an easy enough trip down. Right. It just f- immediately skips to that. Yeah. He sneaks his way back. Yeah. I'm okay with that one. He goes to Stalig's office and he finds Stalig dead. Oh, of course. As he's standing there, Fredel and Seven Dagum come in behind him. Dagum. And they're like, we got you, boy. We got you right there, boy. You can't get away now, boy. Gotcha, bitch. Uh, and so they apprehend him. Yep. They take away his weapons. They take away his, uh, his breastplate thing and his gauntlet. And Fredel is like, he, he takes his gauntlet and he's like, ah, so this is what you went down to find. Well, that's too bad. It's mine now. And Ronan's like, yep. Yep. That's it. You <laughs> that's got it. it. Sorry. You got me. There it is. It's right there. Now, this is the weirdest fucking part of the book. All right. Fredel is kind of bragging to him. Okay. And he's like, uh, I knew pairing you with Boris would lead me to what I wanted to find. Sure. He's like, oh, it was my was, plan all along. It was all part of my plan. But then he gets really like homoerotic all of a sudden. And he kind of is stroking <laughs> Ronan's chest. All right. Well, you did say everyone wants to fuck him. And he's like, it, it'll be such a pity to damage this magnificent body. Oh, out of fucking nowhere. Oh. Literally out of nowhere. Wow. Yeah. At that moment, Voss arrives. So he is the Salamander's Chandran. Right. The dude that throws Right, knives. the dagger dude. Bitch boy. Yeah. Who's bitch not boy. quite a bitch. Right. He arrives and is like, oh, sorry to walk in on this, guys. Uh, no, he, he just tells Fredel, he's like, look, the Salamander wants him, so I'm going to take him to the Salamander. Uh-huh. Fredel is furious. As he would be. But he's like, I mean, I could just die. Yeah. So, okay, <laughs> you get him, I guess. Yeah. But he's like, I'm not happy about this. And I'll talk to the salamander about this. Fair, fair play. But I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to write your, a letter. I'm going to tell your dad <laughs> you did this. <laughs> My dad's the one who told me to do this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when you're the boss's son. So when he gets to the, where the, the salamander's place. Yeah. The salamander tries to use this as leverage against Ronan. He's like, look, I just saved your ass. Right. And I want you to come back and work for me uh-huh. like you used to. Mm-hmm. And this is, this is a huge back and forth during the whole book. They're, re- they're really hostile towards each other because the Salamander is like, you are literally the best fighter I've ever seen. You have more potential than, e- than even me, but you refuse to let me teach you right. and work for me. Like you could be, you could rule this shit and you won't. So he, he kind of resents Ronan for that. Right. And Ronan is just like, dude, get off my dick. <laughs> I told you no. <laughs> like, I'm sick of this. Yeah. So the salamander is like getting nasty. Uh, he's like, okay, well, let's just cut the shit. Yeah. You're going to tell me what I want to know. He's yeah. like fully unveiled now. Sure. It's like, I don't give a fuck about you. I have my own plans. Right. And, and, and you could have been a part of them. I'm yeah. fine if you're not. And he's like, I'm in charge of this bitch, and you'll do what I say or die. Yeah. Right? Yeah. At that moment, a bunch of bladesmen run in, and they tell the salamander, Boros has escaped. Oh, no. Yep. Uh, Boros was in Fredel's custody. And it turned out Fredel and Salamander were kind of working together on some things. Oh. They both wanted to use Boros. Uh, and so they come in and tell the salamander, and the salamander was like, ah, fuck. All right, Voss, you take care of, you know, Dickless here, and then I got to go figure Bitch out- Bitch boy, kill Dickless. Yeah, I got to go figure out this Boros situation. So Voss is escorting Ronan away. We don't know where. He's just, just kill him. Just escorting away. And it's just Voss and Ronan. Of course it is. And Voss has a uh, one of his daggers against the back of his neck or something. Yeah. So he's escorting him down some hallways to somewhere. We don't know. Yeah. So as he's escorting him, Niren comes out of nowhere and fucking murders Voss's ass. Randy Niren RKO out of nowhere. Um, and you know how he murders him? He literally steps out with his sword. And he's like, hey, Voss, I'm going to kill you. Voss throws his daggers and misses. <laughs> so literally Niren just walks up and pokes him and he's dead. 
<laughs> like, lose. It's the dumbest shit. That's hysterical. Though. It's like uh, I. Could've... That's very vindicating You're for right. anyone who's ever thrown knives. It's like I could have told you that was going to happen. Like, yeah, like, come on. No, this is why we don't do this. Then, like almost immediately, Niran catches a stray dagger in the throat. <laughs> no idea where it came from. Yeet. Ronan has no idea where it came from. Hmm. Niran dies. Yeah, it's sad. He was Ronan, almost a character. Ronan has no more friends. He, he is, has he's out of friends. He has his girlfriend who is not his friend, but is his right. bang buddy. Exactly. It, it's kind of a confidant, but yeah, he never asked her to his do anything. His medic friend died. His other friend who wasn't his friend who stabbed him died. Giffan died. That was the guy who stabbed him. And then Niran oh, yeah. died. The, I forgot to stab him. Nice. Yeah, yeah, no, Gafanda and him weren't friends, but then they right. were. And then they, well, they were friends through necessity. Yeah, they were like we yeah. both understand what's going on and yeah. we're desperate, so let's work together. Because what else are we gonna do? Because I stabbed you in the shoulder yesterday. So, so the dagger comes out of nowhere, kills Niran. Ronan is like, "Where the fuck did that come from?" I don't know. Anyways, he starts going up the levels to the top level. Okay, because he's like. Everything's going to shit. I have no more friends. Yeah. This scroll is useless to me. I might as well get out of here. <laughs> Why not just leave? Yeah. So he goes to the top level and then he finds the hatch to the way out, which uh-huh. is normally heavily guarded, but Boros is gone. So like all the guys are out looking for we him. We got to get everyone. Yeah. Um, so they leave the hatch unguarded. Yep. And so he walks up to the ladder that goes to the hatch and then turns around all of a sudden because someone is rushing him. Ah. And a sword clashes against his as he draws it. It's Kareem. Oh, no. She reveals to him that she had been a student of the salamander all along. <sighs> and that she and the salamander were working a secret plan to get revenge on Ronan. I don't feel like this payoff is earned. <laughs> no, because we haven't had any time with Kareem. She's the only in, time she's with him is when they bang yeah, or when she, she does medical things. That's, she, she's a medical student who's a bang buddy. That's all she is. But I mean, I guess she's not. That's interesting. Right. They battle. It is emotional. I thought you were going to say they bang. <laughs> No, they battle. <laughs> They're battling to the death now. Yeah. Uh, it's emotional. He feels betrayed. She has nothing but anger towards him because she is like fanatically uh, right. devout to the salamander. And she was like, you betrayed him and he loved you and you didn't love him back and I'm going to fucking kill you. How are you able to emotionally connect with him? And now you're. I don't know. Uh, so, so Ronan uses his gauntlet effectively to like grab her sword and then he nice. stabs her. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, and she dies. Oh. So now he really has no friends. Yeah. Now he's like, uh, he's the lowest point. He's like, got, well, not exactly the lowest point, but pretty close. Yeah. Uh, and then he's like, this is sad. I'm sad. I need to leave now. So as he's again going to the ladder, uh-huh. the lift door opens behind him. <sighs> he turns around. It's the salamander. Oh, there it is. Of course it is. Why wouldn't it be? And the salamander is smiling. No, oh, you killed your bang buddy. And he said, I know something you don't know. Okay. And the salamander is like, you have no idea what you've just done, do you? I killed my bang buddy. And Ronan is like, you're a bastard and you've lost. So just either come at me or fuck off because I'm leaving. Yeah. Do it or don't, pussy. The salamander was like, Kareem, the woman you just killed, Uh was actually your long lost sister. This feels even less earned than the previous less earned payoff. He banged her. I know. For years. Yeah. Yeah. That's fucked up. <laughs> it is, but also you have to take his word for it. That too. He doesn't know that for a fact. It's just the salamander telling him. That. Yeah. Is this is like a. Star- this is like an when old boy. Seventy seven. Yeah, seventy seven. So this is pre Return of the Jedi. Yeah. Um. So, ugh, fuck. <laughs> this is an old boy twist. Really, it is. Without having seen that movie, yes, it is. Ronan gives the classic. That's not true. That's that's impossible. impossible! So Ronan screams and lunges at Salamander, but the lift door is closed just in time and his sword just scrapes against the metal. Hmm. Uh, and you can hear the Salamander laughing as the ah, lift, ah, ah. the lift like descends. I'm trying Jimmy Carr laugh. <laughs> 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 so uh, Ronan is now at the lowest point. Now he's, oh yeah, because now, now his dead girlfriend's his dead sister girlfriend. Yeah. And so he, he goes over and m- mourns for a second and then closes her eyes And then he starts climbing up the ladder to the hatch Mm -hmm. to be continued. Yep. There it is. That's it. So that's a a relatively satisfying ending for that. Yeah. I, like I said, I I like the story for the most part. Yeah. It's actually, I think it's pretty interesting, even though it, it seems cliche, but this was again, an old book. Right. So it might've not seen that cliche at the time. Right. My biggest thing at the beginning was the names. It was hard to keep track of everything. Yeah. But then once you get those down, 
the story itself, like you said, the story is very, very interesting. It is, it, it does, it held me. Right. Yeah. It was it's, captivating almost. I, I think it was maybe a little bit bloated. No, it was definitely bloated. It took too long to establish that they're after him. Right. There was like three fucking encounters. Yeah. Where yeah. it's like, they're after me. Oh, they're still after me. They're after me again. Part three. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's like. Like, bro, they're after you. you could, Come on. You could literally condense that into one encounter. Right, exactly. There, the, I think a lot in this book is like that. The The author is so fucking flowery with descriptions. It, it, it's it's like seem, it seems like he is and then he's told oh you can't be this long-winded right so then he just cuts out other parts yeah it's uh it's really really it's really frustrating what i think is he had he had a story because this is one book in a trilogy right i think he had like he had a big story in mind and then the, an editor was like you have to stretch this to maybe it was two books and he's like you have to stretch it to three mm-hmm. or maybe you mm-hmm. wanted to stretch it to three because it in some parts of the book it feels really bloated yeah and there's some parts that are really underdeveloped yeah and the writing style just pissed me off because it's like right just random shit happening and then i didn't know what when where who and then once i figured that out i have to go back and reread it so it makes sense right exactly it was like fucking exhausting so it's it's a really interesting story. I dug it. I like the characters. I love uh, Beniculus or whatever his name was in the lower city. Benicio del Toro. <laughs> I, I think it was... Uh, Bonaduce. Bonaduce. Yeah. Yes, that was it. I, I really like his character. He was really cool. Um, it, and that's, that's something too, because I do... On this show, you may have noticed, I do a gag where I will say a name that is very similar to the actual name. Right. When I can actually remember that character's name, that is a it's mark a good, yeah. to that character. Do you remember the guy he killed in the duel in front of the instructor and all the other students? Mark Sh- Yeah, you got it. I thought <laughs> I thought for sure you would not remember that. I, I only because it was a normal name right. with a sh and we made a bit about it. Yeah. That's the only reason I remember. If you ask me the other there was Totem was one of the three friends at the table. I don't even there was, remember. There was there was Sir Galahad. Yeah. Uh and then there were the three friends who were like, these people don't matter. And I think one of them was Totem and one of them was I don't even remember. I don't remember. I don't either. remember. But but that's what I'm saying. That we're like when I can remember a character and I can actually get their name in my head because I'm terrible with names. Yeah. But when I can remember a character and remember their names and remember the actions associated with that name, that's huge on that character. That means right. it's, to me that means it's a well written character. Yeah. Because I remember it and I'm terrible at that. Yeah. No. It, it definitely. I. I really. Yeah. It's. I think all the characters were memorable. Yeah. To me, which yeah. was surprising. It was really surprising to me. The part that, because at first it throws a lot at you. It throws a lot of terms, a lot of right, names. Right, right. I mean, it is world building. Right. And in the the the, the different terms like Sardin, Chandran, Tech, Near. Those were very hard to get down. Yes. The first like few chapters, I had a really hard time. But then yeah. once I had it, it's like you have it. Exactly. It's, exactly. It's, it makes once sense. you're in the world, it's good. The author did a great job of sucking me in. Mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. nothing like really broke my immersion. Like it was a very fun, interesting, easy read. Nice. Uh, well, easy is a bit okay. Maybe not easy, but it was a, it was a, it was an entertaining read. Yeah. No. No. I because yeah. I was I was always with it, even right. though some parts were very frustrating and slow. Right. I was always in it. We on the show have a rating system uh, consists of a scale of one to five, with one being toilet paper. Mm-hmm. Right. It is uh, not worth the material that's printed on, if that. Uh, two is a shampoo bottle, right? It is something that you pick up and read if you have to, but it's not entertaining. It's just there. Uh, three is an Ikea manual. It is competent, well-written, not necessarily entertaining, not something maybe you pick it up on clearance, maybe you don't. Four is a Kindle pick, which is worth owning electronically, you know, to the book you buy at the thrift store, uh, which this one was a book we bought at a thrift store. Yeah. Uh, and then five, we have a hardcover, which is, it's a must own instant classic. So what was your name? <laughs> God damn it. God damn it. You are a Bespin engineer. You are a Bespin technician. Technician. It's a Bespin technician. I normally write it down. I didn't write that one down. So Bespin technician, what is your rating? I feel really conflicted on this book because as I've said a couple times, I love the story. Mm -hmm. I hate the author. Right. (laughs) So I'm very conflicted. Right. If the author wasn't so irritating in his writing style, I would absolutely give this a Kindle pick. Okay. Um, It's thoroughly entertaining. I like the world building, even though a lot of it is cliche now. Sure. Um, the characters are very memorable. Um, the main character is not that likable for the most part. Right. Um, but I like all of the side characters. Even Kareem, I, I liked her, even though she didn't really do much. She wasn't a whole lot of a character. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, at the end of the reveal, I'm like, this was not earned at all. Right. And it just felt so flat. Yeah, and, it felt the same way. And I, I literally didn't feel anything. 
like him confronting her and killing her and then finding out as his sister. Like they don't mention his sister like hardly at all. It's at the very beginning. It's like you, his did, I, you did say that you said his sister disappeared. Yep. I completely forgot. Exactly. You told me to remember it. And so I didn't. Did I. I forgot because they. OK. They, oh, okay. <laughs> so it was it, it still wasn't earned, but it makes a lot more sense. Yes. Because at the very beginning. Yeah. They're like his sister disappeared when they were kids. Yeah. And then yeah. two times during the novel. They briefly mention, I remember doing this with my sister. And that's it. And then at the end, you're supposed <laughs> Do to Do you be... remember doing your sister? <laughs> <laughs> Technically, yes, he does. Not in that context. Yeah. But... And then at the end, it's supposed to be a big bombshell. Like, Kareem was his sister. It's like, no. <laughs> or like, <laughs> Wait. Why, like so? Wait, what? Why? Yeah, like, uh, so why? 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 Uh, that was not earned at all. Yeah. That should have been an, in, every, like, I think his motive, he, cause he had no motivation. Right. He should have been motivated by his missing sister. Right. Then it would have been impactful. Well, and now, and now we've got the thing too, where we have, so this is a trilogy, right? We have the running villain who I assume is going to be the salamander, the salamander Basu. I would have liked to see the reveal that Kareem betrayed him and then they get separated somehow. And then that's the conflict in book two. Yeah, that would have, Yeah. Great. <laughs> that would have been interesting to me. But I mean, we'll see. We'll, we'll see where this goes. Maybe. Maybe. If we if we continue this on the show, we might not. I, Let us know if you want to stay. The, but. Yeah. We'll see how the feedback is. Yeah. Because I because I just I really don't like the author. Just the way the author writes is is infuriating. Yeah. So like, I don't know if I want to read another one. We'll put in the work, but let us know if it's worth right. it. Right. And, th- and that's why my rating is so conflicted, because I have to say Kindle Big because of the story. Because I like the story. Mm-hmm. In the end, when I look back on it, I'm like, I'm glad I read that. That was like entertaining and fun. Would would you recommend somebody else read it? Yes. Just with that warning where it's like, if okay. you don't mind reading through bloated, flowery descriptions and nonsensical, nonlinear storytelling. Okay. If you don't mind that, then it's a great read. But um, but that 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 is the one thing where I'm like, I don't want to read another one of his novels, at least right now. Yeah. Because I'm just kind of fed up with that yeah no and and i think that's the beauty of the show too is we can explore a lot of different right i can totally come back to it later yeah, yeah. Give, us, um, give ourselves a break and then but definitely definitely kindle pick definitely kindle pick. It's, okay. it's a solid book all it's right a solid fun book and i i like i was afraid that because like that gauntlet doesn't come up till the very end right and i was like they're never going to explain this it's just going to be random art that they you're right yeah they just found art or probably yeah. stole it from somebody which there's a <laughs> probably stolen they uh there's another book cover for a later release of this book Mm -hmm. that looks way better oh and we can pull it up after the show but i mean if you're listening to this just go google the book on google images and there's there's actually several different book covers the the one i have is the earliest publication Mm -hmm. right this is the 1977 publication book cover yeah um but there's more contemporary ones there's one from like the late 80s that is like my favorite one that just looks way better it seems to fit the story more yeah like, this looks a little out there because 70s art was like that. Right. And then the the more contemporary, like, 80s one was like, oh, yeah, this looks more like what they would actually look like mm-hmm. in this this place, right? But, yeah, no, uh, I, I I guess I would recommend it. Yeah, it's I, I enjoyed it. It was great. Nice. So if you guys want to get in touch with us, you can always email us at a page too far at gmail.com. That's a page T-O-O far at gmail.com. Uh, you can also hit us up on Instagram where we make posts every week about what book we're reading and other miscellaneous things like what's on our shelf. We also have a Twitter. Uh, do we tweet out episodes on the Twitter? We do. We tweet out episodes and we're kind of changing formats here. Still trying to figure out what to do with our socials. We're trying to figure it out, but the most recent one we've been um, submitting the covers of the books. So it's same same story on Twitter. Uh, we also have a Patreon. We have a lot of uh, bonus content that we've put up and are going to put up. Mm-hmm. On our lowest tier of the Patreon, you can get early access to all of our episodes a day early. Full 24 hours. It won't let me do any differently. And in addition to that, you also get outtakes every month. Uh, Not all of the stuff we say in our episodes makes it into an episode. We take all of the best golden nuggets and pull them out and put them into a outtakes compilation and post that on our Patreon. In addition to that, we also have footnotes. It's essentially an outtake, but it's really long. (laughs) <laughs> Just if we go on a if we go on a tangent or something like that, I tell stories a lot. Yeah, if we go uh, on a, if we go on a real tangent yeah. that we just don't know where to put, we'll put it up as a footnote segment. Yeah, just something on Patreon for fun, right? And that'll just be a bonus to the lowest tier. Just yeah. and that won't that might not be a regular thing. It's just whenever it happens, yeah, exactly. we'll put it up. It's unpredictable. 
The next tier up at the $5 tier, you get a bonus episode every month. That is a full-length episode. Sometimes we go a bit longer. It's usually longer than a full-length episode. Well, our second episode wasn't that long, actually. It was like an hour 40. Was it really? Yeah, it wasn't that long. That felt so long. It felt really <laughs> that long. That was a long recording. recording. It, but it, it turned out not to be that long. And I yeah. didn't even cut out that much. It just wasn't that long. Maybe it's because, maybe it was because we did two books. We Yeah, we did two stories. So, so that maybe that just felt longer. It felt longer because of that. Um, but yeah, we do bonus episode every month and, uh, we're planning on having longer, less cut down episodes for yep. bonus episodes. Yep. In addition to that, we may do additional bonus episodes, depending on how we're feeling, uh, coming up Halloween, we're going to have a special holiday episode posted in addition to our regular bonus episode. Yep. That episode is already recorded. It's already, is it edited already? No. Okay. <laughs> I okay. haven't had the courage. <laughs> Don't blame you. That's going to be a rough one. That I will be doing that soon, though. Yeah. Because Halloween's coming up. So I'm going to have to do that. So, yeah, check all that stuff out. Uh, and we appreciate any support we get. This show definitely eats up a lot of our time. Mm -hmm. um, we have to spend hours reading and picking the books that we do. Uh, I know one of the episodes I went through about four. I went through four books before I found a book that I could actually use. That was the fifth book. Right. <laughs> and that ate up a lot of my time. Right. And that's the, that's the most that we've had. There's been a few weeks where like personally I've had to a skip couple a book, duds, gotten but, a couple through, um, but it's never been that bad. But that, that one was bad. Yeah. That was a dry spell yeah. that I had to rush through, but it, it eats up hours trying to find and read books for the show. In addition to that, I am the editor for the show. Yes. And for every, every produced hour of the show. Every hour of the podcast you listen to mm -hmm. takes on average five to six hours of my time to edit down. Right. And that's not an exaggeration. That is truth. Nope. I have, <laughs> so, I have watched it. It is incredible. The amount of work that goes into the show behind the scenes that I know nothing about. And that is mostly because we're working with very basic equipment. We had mm -hmm. to get very mm -hmm. cheap microphones, very cheap microphones, and also because I am extremely anal about editing and yes. I want it to sound very, very nice. As nice as I can. So that takes up a lot of our time. That, if that's For me, that is a part-time job. Like a week could be up to 30 hours of just work just on our podcast. So any and all support we get is vastly appreciated. And we love our patrons. Uh, we call them our little, our little readers. Our, <laughs> I don't, <laughs> we, we don't have a pet name yet. We're, that's pending. We but, do now. But we appreciate our patrons. We mm -hmm. say very nice things only to our patrons. We whisper in their ear for bonus episodes. Yeah. So be a patron today and we'll see you there. Uh, hashtag uh, Bobo lives. Mm -hmm. Always hashtag Bobo lives and hashtag stab them with friendship. This hashtag stab them with friendship. <laughs> if you don't come back for the next episode, I'm going to stab you with friendless friend, friendship. Fuck. He can't even say it. I'm out. Bye.